Okay, I'd like to call the regular meeting of Tuesday, February 28th, the Comox Valley Regional District Board to order. And I'll acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, the original keepers of this land, and we are grateful for their stewardship. And as we continue our path toward reconciliation, part of that is to inform ourselves of the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And today we are talking about action number 19, and it has to do with health. We call upon the federal government in consultation with Aboriginal peoples to establish measurable goals to identify and close the gap in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities and to publish annual progress reports and assess long-term trends. Such efforts would focus on indicators such as infant mortality, maternal health, suicide, mental health, addictions, life expectancy, birth rates, infant and child health issues, chronic disease, illness and injury incidents, and the availability of appropriate health services. Thank you. And with that, we're moving to adoption of minutes from February 14th. Moved by McCollum, seconded by Morin. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. And that takes us to public input for the financial plan for 2023 to 2027. And I'll pass it over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. Nothing to report or add to the agenda at this time, but again, if members of the public have input for the, the process of the financial plan, our website has all the information and anything provided will be circulated to the appropriate committee or commission of the regional district. Thank you for that. Okay, so that takes us to reports. And today we have the first item, Comox Valley Transit Management Advisory Committee minutes from both December 8th and January 26th. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grieve. Is there any um, discussion around those minutes? And it's a vote full board, all in favor? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't see that. Director Cole Hamilton, yeah. go ahead. No problem, Chair. Um, I was just noticing that it uh, states that BC Transit will be working with the RD and the RTN to investigate connecting the two communities and updates are expected in the coming months. I'm just wondering um, kind of where we are in this process and it might seem to an outside observer that it shouldn't, that it might be easier to complete than this. I was just wondering how long the process was likely to take. Thank you very much, Chair. And Mike Zabarski is here. I'll just call, I'll call him up to the podium to answer that question for you. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Through the chair to the committee or the board, sorry. Um, yeah, so BC Transit are applying to do some service investigations as part of the Transit Future Action Plan um, work. And this investigation of, of a connection with the Nanaimo service is part of that. Um, they haven't firmed up their work plan yet, but what we're being told is it probably won't happen until next year, that service investigation, let alone any, you know, service implementation. So that's probably at least a year away, just the service discussion. Thank okay. you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, follow uh, up. And I'm assuming that we're, we are kind of beholden to their timetable, that this is not something we can expedite at all. Um, I think expediting it would involve probably us hiring our own consultant, like a transit consulting agency and doing that work ourselves and then kind of keeping BC Transit in the loop, obviously. But that, from what I understand, is the, the barrier to moving quicker is just their, their availability of, of planning staff in their, in their organization. So they're busy with our service planning, for example, on the sewer conveyance project and expansions and, and whatnot in other systems. Um, so I think the only way we could entertain anything move, moving quicker is just to do it ourselves. Um, okay. Um, and do we have an idea of just how large a scope that would be to do it ourselves? I'm not suggesting we do. I'm just curious if it's not at least a year of delay before being able to link the services up as to what that would involve. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of dependent on our partner in RDN and whether they're willing to commit similar amounts of resources that we would be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, hiring a consultant and coming up with a very detailed service plan 
uh, that the board could consider, you know, adopting some some expansion hours for uh, is probably, you know, close to a year of, of work, I would imagine. So, you know, possibly by the budget process for next year, we can be in a, in a position to approve the service hours to move forward with, but it would be, yeah, dependent on RDN's abilities to participate in that work with us. So even if we were to do it ourselves, there wouldn't be considerable gains in the uh, in the timeline then? Uh, I think it would move us up, you know, at least a year, if not more. Yeah. So it won't, it won't get us in a position where I, I think we'd be looking at maybe service on the road this year, obviously, but mm -hmm. it would definitely shave a year off, off of any timeline, I would expect. Okay. Thanks for the background, Mike. Yep. Chuck Driver. Yeah, just showing obviously support for um, us trying to accelerate the Cowichan Valley and the Nanaimo district. I know managed to accelerate the establishment of their interregional bus by a year or two. So it may be good to um, see if, as Dr. Paul Hamilton, see if there's a pathway for us at the political level. I don't mind if some of us talk to the RDN colleagues. I know that my colleague to the south. Stuart McLean is very keen to see this happen. Uh, Vanessa Craig, their chair, I think. She, uh, but we can test the waters. I know that when I've talked to the RDN colleagues in the past, they are very supportive of connecting the two systems. Thank you. And Dr. Cole Hamilton. I just had one other question. Uh, there was just a note that the um, the e-bike rebate incentive program remains under review. I'm just curious, what what's the status of the review and when it might be concluded? Thanks for calling Mike again. Um, yeah, so we have reviewed the program in Saanich and one in Nelson. Uh, Saanich is uh, working with UBC to do a review of the kind of success of that program and the, the outcomes of it. Uh, we just got the interim report from that work, but the final report won't be completed until next year. Um, so we were planning to bring forward kind of a synopsis of of the um, the Sandwich program and, and the results and an option for this board to consider in the next month or two. Um, so soon, more details. Great. Thank you. Okay, so we're on receipt of those two reports. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And we're on to the 2023-2027 financial plan for Comox Valley Transit Function. Second. Moved by Arbor, second by Grant. And uh, thank you, Mike Zborski, for coming tonight to, to present this report and answer any of your questions. Yes. Um, is the clicker hand? Uh, yeah, so we have a presentation here on the transit budget, and I appreciate um, being first on the agenda this time around. So kudos uh, to Lisa for making that happen. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> you've been talking to Jake. He wanted to flip the agenda on us. <laughs> Uh, so this is a presentation for the 2023 to 2027 financial plan for Function 780, 780 which is the Comox Valley Transit Service, uh, regional transit system. Uh, this is a graphic we developed uh, on this first slide here a couple of years ago to kind of illustrate the nature of our transit system, which is a regional one where we have um, kind of a higher frequency uh, line, which is that green line, and then a number of local uh, routes that connect into that. And we do connect all areas of the region. Oh, let's turn it on. Well, wow, there we go. Oop. There we go. Okay, so the um, service, Comox Light Transit Service provides conventional service, which is the fixed route, fixed schedule, bigger buses that we see rolling around. And it also provides paratransit or custom transit, which is the community buses and the handy dart services. And they, like I mentioned before, they serve uh, the vast majority of our, of our region. And we use the Transit Future Action Plan from 2022 to guide how we improve that service. 
Um, one of the key things that public transit does is that it provides people with an opportunity to get out of their car and use a different mode of transportation. Uh, so that's really important from a greenhouse gas perspective as transportation is, is one of the largest uh, sources of emissions in the community. Ridership performance has been really good. We've done really well at ridership recovery coming out of the pandemic. In fact, we're one of the leading uh, communities from a ridership recovery perspective in BC. But we are expecting that the ridership could drop a bit uh, this year should the sewer conveyance project um, start, start up and the construction impacts associated with that sewer conveyance project are expected to have fairly significant uh, impact on, on traffic and congestion. And of course, transit will get kind of caught up in that and uh, could impact ridership. The 2023 estimated uh, residential tax rate is 0.1029 per thousand, which on an $800,000 home equates to about $83. Some of the uh, accomplishments from 2022 inc include completing a number of very foundational studies. So we did the Transit Future Action Plan, which is our, our guiding document for service improvements. This was an update of our 2014 Transit Future Plan. And this prioritizes the service improvements and infrastructure improvements that we're looking to pursue in the next few years. We also completed the transit infrastructure study, and this is a, a project that identified all of the transit exchanges and transit priority measures that would work best for the region and allow us to continue expanding, improving, becoming more efficient in a more desirable mode. And the transit operations facility study was a piece of work to identify a new BC transit owned uh, or publicly owned uh, transit operations facility. Our current facility is a, is a private leased facility and it's getting close to the end of its life as far as size and a number of other constraints go. Uh, and a new facility would, would involve um, room for expansion of the transit system. And also, very importantly, uh, charging of electric buses, which is in the in the medium term future. The image on the left is showing uh, an example of transit priority measure. That's a Q jumper lane. So we have a couple of these planned where a bus would bypass traffic congestion that's stopped at a red light, and it would get a, a kind of a preempted green light just for the bus, and it would jump ahead of that line of traffic. So we have a few of those, or a couple of those anyway, planned in the, in the near future. And then on the right, just as a, kind of the prototypical design uh, kind of layout of what a transit operations facility would look like with, with the bus parking on the bottom there, um, bus uh, maintenance bays and the office and the driver break rooms, and those kinds of things on the top. Also last year, we implemented a 3,600 hour transit expansion in the conventional system. This did a number of things. It added a new Route 15, which travels from Comox Mall to the Aquatic Center North Island College area via back road. Uh, and we also added some more frequency on routes number one, which is our, our main uh, transit route, and also route number 10 down to Fanny Bay and route number 12 up to Aisha River. And also with those hours, we were we were trying to address some runtime issues that transit has been experiencing, especially route number one, which is that that main trip or main route that goes through the, the vast majority of our denser areas of the community. And because of the tra traffic congestion over, over time, it's getting slowed up uh, and taking more time for each trip. So some of those hours went to address that. In 2023, we have a number of things planned. So like I mentioned, the sewer conveyance project will have a big impact on transit and we're looking at either a cost neutral uh, op option where we don't put in expansion hours or we don't have any expansion hours put in and a 3000 hour expansion where we we can maintain service levels so again it's going to take more time for each trip and so we need to add hours on to maintain the number of trips or we will end up with a cost neutral um, service reduction so to speak so it'll it'll end up with less trips on the system less bus trips per hour kind of thing um, we're also going to be doing a lot of preliminary implementation work for those transit infrastructure projects. So on the exchange and transit priority measures front, we'll be submitting the funding application to senior levels of government in March, and then waiting hopefully to hear successfully about that before we get into the planning, design, and engagement activities around those transit priority measures, transit exchanges. 
And then the operations facility right now, BC Transit are looking to acquire property. Once they have a tentative property lined up, they'd be coming back to the board with a bit of a business case. And then should the board support proceeding, we would be getting into the more detailed kind of design, uh, geotechnical investigations, environmental investigations, those kinds of things on that specific property. The UMO electronic fare collection system is coming in in July this year. This is the much uh, anticipated electronic fare collection uh, technology that would replace the, the kind of more traditional uh, setup that we have right now. So the mag stripe cards would be no longer a thing. The paper tickets would no longer be a thing and there'd be a, a kind of a tap to pay um, or a scanner on board each bus that would allow people to pay with a reloadable smart card their mobile wallet on their on their smartphone, um, continuing to allow people to pay with cash. You could tap that debit card, tap credit card, a number of different more kind of convenient options would be available to the public. So we're excited about that. That's happening in, in July and we'll have a very, very large uh, public engagement and outreach process associated with it as long as, as well as a number of other kind of back-end changes that are required on the vendor side and in our internal financial uh, sides as well. And then the annual transit improvement program. So this is the program that comes every year to the board to seek the board's interest in expansions or improvements for the following three years. Uh, it might be hard to read on the side of this slide. There's a bit of a, a kind of a workflow of how that, how that happens. So every year we come in usually later spring, early summer, BC Transit recommends a number of service improvements, gives us a sense of the costs and benefits of that. And then the board can consider whether they want to support them. If they do, these get worked into the budget for the following year, and then they get implemented in that following year. Mm -mm. Doesn't want to move. Oh, there we go. Okay. So this is the uh, budget comparison slide showing last year's budget with this year's proposed budget and the, and the variances. Uh, requisition, tax requisition is up $450,000 as well as bus fare revenue being up 121,000. And these are necessary to support a number of increases to the transit operating costs, such as the additional service hours required for the sewer conveyance project, which were approved last year. Um, some uh, additional on-road transit supervisor capacity within our, our operating company, the UMO advanced or sorry, electronic fare collection system, and just transit industry inflation. As you can all imagine, the, the fuel is a big one for transit with, with the price of fuel right now being so high, it's been a big hit to, uh, to transit. Um, from a capital cost perspective, we don't directly own capital in this service, but we do contribute to it through our annual operating agreement, and BC Transit owns that. Right now, that's limited to the buses. We contribute to a lease fee on those buses, uh, but starting in 2024, we've got contributions towards the transit infrastructure, starting in $25,000 a year and rolling up to $100,000 a year over this five-year plan. And that will be kind of refined as we go along once you know more details are known about the the timing of the projects and the applications that we've made for funding etc and reserves are pretty healthy we did get uh, a lucky um, kind of insert of money with the safe restart program we got a couple of big chunks to help support transit during the pandemic and those have been put into reserves to help offset our revenue or sorry, offset our requisition increases, uh, deal with some of these uh, infrastructure costs that are going to be coming up and um, possibly other projects that the board might be interested in. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks, Mike. And we do have a question. Director Hardy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And uh, um, sorry in regards to my ignorance with regards to the operations facility for the for the transit. Um, do we currently have a operations facility in the Comox Valley right now for our transit buses? Yeah, so right now there's a private facility that's leased by the, the contract operator up in uh, Comox near the airport. 
And so that site is, like I said, privately owned near the end of life. And BC Transit study has basically identified a publicly owned new facility capable of allowing us to expand and allowing us to put in the, the electric charging infrastructure for, for the electric buses that will be coming. So if I could, a follow-up question would be, um, again, based upon the search and rescue delegation that was in a couple of weeks ago and looking for property and looking for infrastructure, I guess the question I have, and I understand that we all, each of these services operates in a silo, is there the opportunity or an avenue for uh, wherever transit looks at putting in place an operations facility where maybe that same piece of property and same piece of infrastructure could be utilized where the search and rescue could have room there as well. Just throwing it out there as, as an idea. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Um, we're looking at that opportunity. We've met with community services about that idea. And, and so it all depends on the property that we, we end up kind of being interested in, whether it's in the right location for the search and rescue folks, whether it has enough uh, additional space. But I, I would suggest that the, the two uses could be very compatible. Thank you. Next, we have Director Arbor. Thanks for the report. Just two or three things. Uh, one, picking up on the previous item, um, if we if we wanted to consider uh, moving uh, forward with the connection to Nanaimo, would this require a budget amendment at this time in order to free up the resources for us to do it internally? Um, as far as studying and developing the service plan, yes, it would require a budget amendment to add those dollars. So uh, maybe we'll sit on it for an, an hour or so, but maybe under new business, I'll think about whether if staff is able to provide even a rough figure uh, or else we can ask for a staff report prior to March 31st to, to identify that. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll just think on that for now. Thanks for the information. The other two is, um, um, I guess, you know, we're facing a pretty big expenditure with the South uh, Terminal, uh, 1.7 million. And so uh, it just occurred to me, um, I'll try to have an ICF board report at the next board, but in the event that funding came through for rail again, which by now British Columbians, Vancouver Islanders don't believe that's possible, but there's a good possibility. Um, yeah. I still, I'm still not sure if the South Terminal would be well located or, you know, I, I was traveling back east last month and the integration of rail and buses and everything is so impeccable. And it seems funny for me that we, if funding come through, maybe I would just ask that we pause on the South Terminal because we may want to actually locate the terminal and the exchange where the railway is. Um, so just a thought in the event it comes, I know you're probably proceeding with, um, you know, advancing the capital project, but, uh, and the last one is just for Hornby and Denman. Is there, uh, uh, last fall you were talking about BC Transit starting to look at, uh, the potential for those runs. Is there any update on that? Um, yeah, similar to the service investigation for the interregional transit, BC Transit are telling us it's at least a couple of years before they're going to be able to review options for a BC Transit led system on, on those two islands. So I think they're, it, at least for the next few years, likely to continue as as they are. Okay, next we have Director McCollum. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I just had a, a question about the transit infrastructure priorities and how we're planning um, the funding around those. Uh, I noticed in the report that we do have just one reserve for like future expenditures, but we don't have anything separate for capital projects. And um, I'm also not clear on how the cost sharing goes with these projects uh, in terms of the municipality's obligation and, and the regional districts. But I'm wondering if um, if we are planning on advancing these both in the short and medium term, if we do need to consider um, putting money aside for them if we're hoping to get um, progress on them or not. It provides some context. Yeah, um, so right now, BC Transit are, are kind of just finishing off the application for federal funding. If that's successful, that would cover between the province and the feds 80% of the cost of these infrastructure projects, including the, um, the operating facility. And so the local share will be 20%, which then is shared by all the participating areas, municipalities, electoral areas. Um, so very advanta advantageous 
funding opportunity. And then the way we would contribute our, to our 20% is either upfront, here's a big lump, uh, or we could go through our annual operating agreement. So they would put an additional amount of money on top of our annual operating costs for the life of that infrastructure, whether it's, it's 10 or 20 years for, for a transit exchange, for example. So um, the preliminary estimates that BC Transit have provided us is once all of the infrastructure is complete, if we choose the annual operating agreement option, it would be $125,000 a year our cost for the infrastructure and between 250,000 and 500,000 a year for the operating facility. So that's kind of once everything is complete and, and on the, on the ground. Um, but that would be phased in, like I said, so we do have already starting 2024, $25,000 put into the, uh, this budget, uh, under the operating contract cost line item. So I think we're covered for, for what we you know expect um, reasonable phase in of this infrastructure to be, and then we'll refine that as we get further into these projects based on the re the realistic timeframes. Yeah, that's really good to understand. I I didn't realize that those um, federal grants related to both the um, the exchanges as well as that facility. So that's um, that's good context. Uh, and then I I guess my other question is also around reserves um, that. Currently, we have 1.3 million, and it's projected to um, be slowly used up over the next um, three, three or four years. It looks like, um, and I'm trying to articulate what I wanted to ask about that. So, basically, we have some funds that we've built up um, partially because we've got some help with um, lost fare revenue from COVID. And this year we're seeing a 3,000 hour increase in transit hours. And um, next year, those hours may come off that, um, that particular route and get reallocated to some of those expansions that we talked about at some point last year. Yeah. Um, but our projections for the tax requisition is basically to use up some of those revenue or those um, reserves to moderate the increases for our, our transit service expansion over the next few years. Is that, yep. is that correct? That's correct. So the first couple of years of our five-year plan, we've got some pretty good tax requisition increases of about 400,000 a year, but then it kind of scales back to about a hundred thousand a year increases and we're able to keep them at that lower uh, number because we're using reserves in those years, bringing it in to, to reduce that that need to increase the, the uh, requisition. Um, and at the end of that five-year plan, we'd have just under $300,000 left in reserves with this current um, you know, allocation that we have here. Okay, yeah, thank you. Great, thanks for those explanations. Next we have Director Grant. Thank you. So I'm just thinking about our Courtney to Nanaimo bus route. And do we have any indication of what kind of ridership we could expect on that? Like, I guess my question is, is there a need? I, I don't know. I mean, when you look Greyhound and I think Tofino Bus Company, they didn't leave the route because they were making so much money. And so I'm just wondering if there's even, like before we start amending our budget and doing all that kind of stuff, there's some basic questions that need to be asked here, I think. And, you know, the other thing is, is this kind of a direct route or is it going to take you eight hours to get to Nanaimo if you take a public transit route? So, it, you know, it, it just like before we go on and start amending budgets and doing that, I don't mind if BC Transit's going to do it and we can actually get the, get an indication of what they're doing. But it seems a little out of step for us to jump ahead when we don't know the basic ideas of what we're talking about here. Um, yeah, so there was a study probably about five years ago now to to try to articulate the ridership potential out of a a you know, multitude of connections on the island. So it actually looked at the entire island and um, the opportunities were fairly low between us and, and, and Nanaimo. There was a pretty good opportunity between Nanaimo and the Cowichan Valley. And that's what BC Transit has acted on to date. Uh, but saying that, you know, potentially conditions have changed in, in the community on the island and there may be a higher ridership potential now. And that would, you know, ideally be one of those first steps that BC Transit would would undertake in that service investigation is to update that that uh, analysis around the ridership potential and the benefits of doing a um, 
um, you know, an interregional connection on, on the island. And then subsequently they would be looking at, well, how do you do it? Is, is it to connect the existing route number 10 that goes down to Fannie Bay with the existing equivalent in, in RDN that I believe goes up to Bowser, you know, so there's maybe a, a three or four times a day connection going down the old highway, probably a, you know, fairly long trip down to Nanaimo. Or is it a more rapid express bus where, where it goes up to the new highway and just goes straight to Nanaimo from here or stops once or twice along the way? So those are all, those are all the things we would need to do um, either with BC Transit or on our own. And I think another thing to keep in mind is that um, with the, the uh, not saying loss of, of Wilson's transportation or, or the Tipino bus, but the, they've kind of put the brakes on for the spring or until the spring here. Um, that's triggered a bit of a movement within the province to review um, a Vancouver Island wide trans transit coach bus. I'm not sure what it would look like, but they're they're going to be looking at what to do on Vancouver Island and possibly across the province because this this issue is not unique to the island. Um, and they have, in fact, in the past established a, a bit of a coach shuttle bus uh, up in the north. BC Bus North is what that one's called. Um, so there could be some provincial initiatives and, you know, I think it will be important to understand what the province is doing before we maybe go too far, but those would be things we would, we would definitely review as part of any, any work. Okay, we do have a number of uh, lights on, so Director Arbor, you're next. Yeah, thanks uh, for those of us who have tracked that topic a bit. Um, some of you may know Leah Main and Ten years ago, she's she's our FCM caucus chair, and uh, and some years ago she started advocacy based on the uh, the highway of tears and and others to, for to the federal government to start looking at all the interconnections not just in BC but across Canada that have been abandoned by uh, private transportation, and there's success now. The federal government is now launching a fund for interregional and interprovincial bus as part of their large uh, transit commitment starting 2026. And there's going to be an opportunity to help shape that. So, um, and I think Mike is right in the context of Vancouver Island. I think we need to look at this. In regards to Director Grant, we do have a precedent. So, you know, the in terms of ridership between since this, they joined the Couch and Valley and the Nimo. Um, within a matter, when they started, they were at like 30, 40, 50 rides a, a day. Now, they in October, they reported they are now at 100 rides a day. Obviously, slightly de more dense, densely populated. Um, personally, I believe that. Um, well, I guess we have the consultant, but it's literally eight kilometers <laughs> that is missing between the Fanny Bay bus and the ninety nine coming to uh, to D Bay. Uh, so, I think at a very minimum cost, we could explore um, because we're already running these buses as we're doing with Campbell River, we could explore whether there is ridership appetite as a pilot project very easily. Thank you, Director Moran. Great, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to send a sort of cute kudos, I guess, to, to uh, our transit folks here. Um, Humboldt's Valley was mentioned during the LGLA uh, conference under the transit presentation as, as uh, um, in terms of ridership numbers post COVID um, as one of the examples of communities that had kind of rebounded and, and had even increased a bit. So um, I think that's probably, you know, due to our great staff and planning and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I guess the other thing that was mentioned at the LGLA conference was obviously the, the electrification and that those um, electric buses are, are going to go to Victoria first, um, most likely. But I just want, if, wondered if you could refresh my memory on um, how the rollout is going to go beyond Victoria, because I believe um, during that presentation at LGLA, they, they did talk about the infrastructure piece and how that would communities that are, um, uh, you know, a bit of, a, ahead of the game in that regard, they didn't say would get preference, but I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Um, and then I just had one other comment after that, if that's okay, Chair. Yeah, so the electric buses, um, the first 10 are going into Victoria that are going to do a trial there for, uh, I understand, a year. 
And I believe there are a couple of other communities, smaller ones, uh, maybe not us level small, but we'll, we're not sure which communities they are that BC Transit are planning to do some, some trials some pilots of these electric buses in the next year or so. Uh, and then based on that, they're going to start uh, rolling it out to other communities within the province. And, you know, while they haven't given us any kind of firm indication how they're going to determine priorities, they have been also pretty clear that we don't currently have any way to charge these buses. And so, yeah. like you mentioned, um, those communities that have a facility that can accommodate the charging are, are, are obvious candidates to have those initial uh, rollouts of electric buses. So um, I, I'm trying to get more accurate schedules and, and rollout information from BC Transit, but to date, you know, they haven't really got a, a firm grasp on where they're gonna deploy those buses past the pilot stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's just something that obviously we, we need to really keep tabs on so that we're kind of ready to go when when the time comes. And Chair, if you don't mind, just a comment. I know this isn't around our, our local transit system, but just in terms of what was mentioned around the regional aspect and the loss of the Tofino bus, um, I just, I mean, I understand the, the business concerns for that, but I I think it just really, um, it's really disturbing when we don't have access to transportation for folks. And I'm thinking primarily around uh, safety issues. We certainly don't want to become a highway of tears um, like the Northern communities. And and um, I just want to sort of put that on on the radar that whatever we can do to um, advocate for those regional transportation systems are hugely important. Um, those um, those cases of victimization are are opportunistic often, and and um, if we have a rural highway system where people are hitchhiking, it's just a, a bad bad situation. So I just wanted to to um, make sure that even though we're talking about local transit, that we're always advocating for, um, you know, the, those transportation systems that, that take into account the vulnerability of folks who um, have barriers to transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morin. Next we have Dr. Hardy. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> uh, in addition to Director Morin's comments there in regards to the AVICC, uh, conference there last week or the week before and the what I understood from what was stated there by the gentleman from BC Transit was the fact that they have over 1300 uh, buses in BC and that they were basing uh, that switch over to electric buses based upon how old the assets were so if you had a one-year-old bus or a two-year-old uh, diesel bus they probably wouldn't be flipping that for an electric uh, bus anytime soon. Um, so just uh, that's one of the things that I took from, from that meeting. Um, going back to, um, again, extending the, the transit line from Fannie Bay South to Nanaimo, I, I guess the question I have for you, Mike, was, uh, is there any appetite from Nanaimo Transit for us to extend that lane? And is there any means of a partnership between the two, uh, Nanaimo and, and Comox Valley with regards to that? Thanks. Yeah, we've had meetings with RD and staff, and they're they're interested. Um, and I'm aware that some of their board members are also keen. Um, so it's a matter of identifying kind of how interested is this a we want it now? Is is this a you know we've got other priorities we want to focus on, and, and we'll do it in in a few years. We don't know that right now, and so that would be part of that service investigation. Um, you know, I think one of the the quick things we could test out is is the idea of connecting some of those route number 10s with the uh the Bowser Deep Bay route um and that you know maybe something we want to consider through the the annual tips process so um that's coming up in late spring early summer and between now and then we could work with BC Transit and RDN to kind of explore and, and at least be able to report back to the board on the possibility of, of a partnership and maybe doing that kind of easy first step of just connecting those those existing routes that are only a few kilometers apart. That sounds good. 
Okay, I don't see any further lights and we're on receipt of the report. So both the full board, all in favor? Any opposed, that's carried. And uh, sorry, it took two meetings for you to get to that presentation, Mike, but no problem. it was a good one. And as you could see, there was a good level of interest. So probably good that we waited, right? Uh, Director Arbor? I'd, I'd, I'd like to move the recommendation, but rather than going for new business, I'm wondering if your CAO would be amenable if I move the recommendation and ask that at a next meeting, um, an amount be considered for what it would cost to do the planning for connecting the two routes internally. So can I move the recommendation as such? I'll move it as such. Okay, so with the addition, um... Yes, so the resolution he has moved and has been seconded is as written here with the addition of staff to bring back a report on the uh, the analysis to be undertaken and the costs associated. Okay, and it's been moved uh, seconded by McCollum. Any further discussion? Director Cole Hamilton, go ahead. Thanks very much. I'm not sure if it necessarily needs to go in the motion or it may just be something the staff would obviously be doing, but it'd be very helpful if they connected with RDN staff in the meantime so that we know that we've got a partner to be reaching out to. Yes, so we'll reach out to the RDN as well. Thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, I think that was something that Mike had, had mentioned during his presentation as well. Okay. Oh, Director Grieve, go ahead. I might just add that when I first brought this issue up in 2011, I was actually laughed at at the table. So things are progressing nicely. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving forward. Okay, I don't see any further lights. So the motion um, is that we approve the budget and that um, staff also come back with what the budget would need to include if we were to look at um, the interregional transportation with the RDM. And it's a vote of the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously, thank you. And we're moving on to Committee of the Whole Minutes from January 17th. Moved by Grieve, seconded by McCollum. Any discussion of those minutes? Seeing none, it's a vote of the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to Electoral Area Service Committee Minutes from January 30th. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grieve. Any discussion of those minutes? And it's full, full board. All in favor? And that's carried. Okay. We're on to recommendation one, moved by Arbor, seconded by Morin. And that is uh, regarding an exemption to the flood plain management bylaw for a property on CB Road. And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. And that is in regard to uh, the advisory planning bylaw and the agriculture advisory planning. And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor. Recommendation three is about um, authorizing joint application with City of Courtney, Village of Cumberland, Town of Comox, and Comox First Nation for grant funding around the Fire Smart program. Any comments? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Hardy. Um, not knowing how things went with your meeting with Chief and Council of Comox First Nation last week, I, I know. Previous council were on board. I'm just not sure whether the current council is or not. So, is is there a need to follow up with chief and council on that particular issue, or are we could on that note, Madam Chair, I can stand corrected by Doug, but my understanding is that we've worked with staff of Comox First Nation, so are relying on their advice as to whether that's necessary or not. Go ahead. Yep. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to recommendation four. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. This is regarding Graham Lake Water Service. Any further discussion? Director Arbor. 
Thanks. Just to advise the board, this is uh, another improvement district that's coming to the fold of, to the regional district. And I would imagine this is not the last you will hear about this one. Thanks. Thank you. Again, it's about the full board. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And we're on to recommendation five. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Morin. Again, regarding the Graham Lake Water Service and the single family dwellings. And any further comments? So vote the full board. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. And recommendation six. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. This is regarding Denman Island Water Service. And, and so vote a full board. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. And we're on to recommendation seven. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grieve. And this is about extending fire service from Cumberland. And so vote full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Okay. Sorry, I lost my place here. Did you say move eight? Are we on eight? Okay, yeah, sorry. So that's the $300,000 of uh, to Black Creek, um, Punt Ledge, Blood Trail Area C Community Works Funds allocated to Mount Washington Fire Protection Service. Any further discussion? Director Hardy, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question in regards to the construction of uh, the fire hall up at Mount Washington. I'm just looking for clarification in regards to have they found a spot where they can do construction on yet? Because my understanding was that there were some problems with engineering studies or whatever for the site that they had uh, kind of sold out and we're now looking for a new site possibly. So just looking for clarification on that. Thanks. Sure, Madam Chair, I'll just ask Doug DeMarzo to come forward and uh, provide a bit of an update as to where things are at with the fire hall proposed for Mount Washington. Thank you through the chair. Uh, you're correct. There's been some geotechnical difficulties with the site that was donated to us originally. Um, since this time, we have undertaken a further expansion of looking at alternative sites uh, with a realtor, and we're currently considering a number of sites, most of which aren't listed, but uh, realtor and Chief Green have a good knowledge and good contacts up on the mountain to undertake this study, at which point we'll re report back to the EASC with options for moving forward and cost considerations if one of those options is to remain the current site. So we're just doing our due diligence to try and bring an affordable project to the community of Mount Washington. Thank you. Go ahead. So sorry, in, in regards to, so we're passing a budget right now on the construction of a fire hall up in Mount Washington. And, and like, do we expect to see the cost maybe be a, a lot different than they were when initially uh, pursuing the project? At this time, we don't expect a major difference in the cost. This will, of course, depend on any land negotiations or otherwise. Um, we do have two designed halls now for the site. So we do have a smaller design and a larger design, and that will impact our decisions. Uh, either way, the ESC will be involved in any budget amendments or conversations regarding additional costs. This time, we're hopeful that we're still within our contingency, but uh, things are ever changing in both the construction landscape and apparently the geotechnical world. Okay, we have another question from Director Brief. Thank you. Yeah, um, just a, a little bit of background on it. Um, as you probably know, it, it took quite a long time to get approval, uh, electoral assent, uh, to get a, a approval for a fire department up at Mount Washington, but it's absolutely integral to the future of Mount Washington. But it's a small community and very onerous price to put in fire halls. So we're using community works funds, which up until a couple of years ago was not eligible for fire halls. So this has been a, a, a big change uh, from the from the feds. So it was $300,000. Um, I would recommend we approve this because the longer we wait and dither, the more expensive it's going to get. 
And, and I think uh, uh, Doug actually explained what happened with the site and it being proven inappropriate at the end. So we do, we probably will have some property for, for, uh, for sale in that area sometime soon. We can work something out with the mountain itself. So I, I encourage everybody to put this forward because it's, it's been a long time coming and uh, it's, it's a big, um, a big plus for the largest economic, private economic driver in the Comox Valley. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Okay, I don't see any further lights. And we are on recommendation eight, $300,000 in Washington. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? We oppose, that's carried unanimously. And we're on to item five, the Comox Valley Recreation Committee minutes from January 17th. Uh, Hillian and Arbor, thank you. Any discussion on those minutes? It's in both full board. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. On to item six, Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee minutes from February 13th. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Arbor. And any discussion of those minutes? It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? And that's unanimous. There's a recommendation. Second. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grief. And that is the water service area, Black Creek Oyster Bay, uh, be amended. And uh, to the water service area, uh, local service area. And that the directors in electoral area C as Drathcona, regional district area D, as participants, amend the service establishment um, bylaw in writing. Any further discussion? Director Arbor? Thank you. Can the can the board clarify? We have two service participants. One is not here right now. So how does it work for voting? Um, Lisa, can you confirm that uh, voting can proceed? Yes, we can proceed with voting. Yes. Is it false to the whole board? Um. Well, um, no. It is a weighted vote, so you carry the weighted. Oh, and the board holds quorum. And the bold board holds quorum. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for clarification. Uh, it is a vote of area C and D. We're on recommendation one. All in favor? And <laughs> one, the one participant raised his hand. So that is unanimous for today. <laughs> So item seven, the electoral area service committee minutes from February 13th. Second. Arbor and Grieve, thank you. And so both the full board, all in favor? And that's carried unanimously. And there's, Second. there's recommendation one, moves by Arbor, second by Cole Hamilton. It's to give first, second reading of bylaw 740, rural Comox Valley zoning bylaw. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Moved. Thank you. Um, moved by Grieve, seconded by Morin. Recommendation two is to give first and second reading to bylaw number 741. And that's the rural Comox Valley zoning bylaw um, regarding Piercy Road. And this vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Second. Moving on to recommendation three, moved by Arbor, seconded by Grieve. And this authorized staff to submit a grant application for uh, UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Disaster Risk Reduction Climate Action Grant. Well, that's a mouthful. It's to uh, construct the Dyke Road Park and Green Shores Demonstration Project. Any further discussion? Let's go to the areas. All in favor? Oh, Director Arbor. Yeah, this one may obviously be of interest to the board due to its connectivity to Kuskusam and other initiatives happening along Dyke Road. And it's a fairly significant application, unless if our CEO remembers, I think it's about a million dollars that we're asking for. So it'd be major improvements to um, an initiative around the Dyke Road area. Thank you for that background. Okay, again, in both the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. 
On to recommendation four, moved by Arbor, second by Cole Hamilton. And that's regarding proposed uh, the financial plan for King Coho Wastewater Service. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to item eight. Service uh, Moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor. This is for the Comox Valley Sewage Commission minutes from February 14th. A vote of the full board. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Item nine. Um, moved by Hillian, second by Grant. And that's for the Comox Valley Water Committee minutes of February 14th. It's about the full boards. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. We're on to Rec Commission minutes from four, February 14th as well. Moved. Moved by Grant, second by Hillian. And vote the full board, all in favor? And that's unanimous. We're on to Electoral Area Service Committee. Uh, oh, the recommendation number one. Second. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Grant. Or sorry, moved by Harbor, seconded by Grant. Thanks for the correction. Um, and that's that uh, Union Bay Tourism Highway Commercial Development Permit uh, be approved. And that's the vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. <laughs> And we're on to item 12. This is the 2023 Indigenous Relations Work Plan, moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor. And I will pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Christiane Wild, Senior Manager of uh, Strategic Initiatives, is here. And she'll present this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, this report summarizes the progress made in 2022 on Indigenous relations and proposes a work plan for 2023. These are both attached as appendices to your staff reports, so I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I'm happy to take any questions at the conclusion of this presentation. And for today's purposes, um, I'd like to walk uh, through you some steps that we're taking towards meaningful reconciliation, uh, as well as our relationship with the Comox First Nation, and some information about how we currently engage with uh, nations that have overlapping land or marine territory within the CVRD service area. In June, 2020, in June 22, the board directed staff to proceed with outreach to form an advisory group on reconciliation under the guidance of our facilitators, Nick Chowdhury and Sonora Morin of Wailamola Consulting. Since then, our three partner municipalities and 10 First Nations and Indigenous community groups have confirmed their intention to participate in the process. In 2023, the group will complete an engagement framework that will ensure cultural safety, help to build relationships and to guide the group's work. The CVRD will continue to support the group in an administrative capacity and goals for the next two years include development of a communications plan, development of an action plan and beginning to identify projects and activities for implementation. The CVRD has been working to build its relationship with the Comox First Nation over the past five years, and this has resulted in the establishment of a monthly meeting with Chief and Council um, to encourage dialogue and ensure meaningful consultation on projects that are of interest to Comox. We are neighbours to Comox Preserve lands and future treaty lands. The CVRD's water treatment plant provides water to Comox IR1 and Penledge IR2, and sewage from these communities is treated at the CVRD's sewage treatment plant. We are partners in water management and sewer planning for the region, and we acknowledge the four pillars of authority, jurisdiction, governance, and management that Comox asserts over natural resources in its territory. The 2023 work plan recognizes that projects of joint interest with Comox will be identified through our work with Chief and Council. Should the CVRD's request for regular meetings be reinstated, Staff acknowledge that it will take time to build this relationship, and therefore priorities uh, for 2023 for partnership, consultation, and advocacy with Comox have yet to be established. Some, in 
some initiatives that we'll bring forward to Chief and Council for guidance in 2023 include how we can work together on emergency management and regional parks and trails, possible collaboration on a tourism strategy, including continuing discussions about Comalc's interest in the visitor centre, either through partnership or possible acquisition, modernization of the Comox Lake Watershed Protection Plan, and working together to improve stewardship in all of the watersheds on Comox unceded territory, as well as interest in pursuing a memorandum of, a memorandum of understanding for the sewer servicing in the south. With three reserves, fee simple lands and treaty lands, the CVRD is in Comox First Nation core territory, and as such, our territorial acknowledgement is to the Comox. For services that operate in Area D, we also acknowledge the Lactolac peoples, and this is the area from the Jubilee Parkway to the Oyster River and east into Strathcona Park. The Government of BC's consultative area database identifies 12 nations with unceded land or marine territory within the CVRD's boundaries that overlap with Comox core territory. Over time, we expect our relationship with some of these nations to grow and evolve. For example, the Comox Valley will act as a host community to neighboring nations and communities who may become displaced by hazards or natural disasters, and this will involve planning and outreach with these communities. Outreach to the Wewakai Nation, Wewakum First Nation, Homoko First Nation, Klahaman Nation, and Qualicum First Nation will occur through the planning and development services referral process. In Wewakai Nation, we become First Nation and Homoko First Nation. They've indicated interest in participating in the Reconciliation Advisory Group, so relationships there can be built at the staff level. Outreach on the sewer extension project will continue with the 12 nations that have traditional land or marine territory within the project boundaries. And the CVRD will initiate outreach to First Nations on any additional projects that require regulatory approval and will utilize the Provincial Consultative Area Database as well as the province's guide to consulting First Nations. The staff report presents two options to put forward to the, for the board's consideration. The first is to proceed with the work plan as proposed, including the engagement with First Nations as I've just described. And the second option is to direct staff to report back with recommendations to pursue additional relationship building with the nations that have overlapping territory with Comox First Nation within the CBRD service area. Happy to take any questions. Great. Thanks for that report, Christian. There are some lights on, uh, starting with Georgia Arbor. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for preparing this report. Um, it was really an interesting read around all the considerations and I can see the rationale if we were to choose option two to just um, not to just but to extend our, our relationship with um, the five nations who have land territory. I guess the other one we're not developing because it's marine and our jurisdiction at CVRD is pretty limited, limited on the marine side, but we can still acknowledge that that could be a possibility to try to uh, develop a relationship with a lot of them. My my main uh, comment, I, I may end up um, favoring option one a little bit. Well, it's most of, mostly a question to staff in our leadership group, to be honest, because Comox is approaching treaty this coming year and we are facing a new chief and council, and I think it's going to take a lot of effort and uh, and energy. And I, I wouldn't want us to um, extend too much our, our own internal capacities if we're going to extend those relationships with other nations in, in a treaty year for COMAX. Maybe I'd I would support it next year or when we have more clarity around our, our relationship with KFN. Um, but I could be uh, persuaded otherwise, especially if staff in our leadership group see that we have the bandwidth to uh, develop these other relationships. Director Killian, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks very much for the report. I appreciate the uh, care and thoughtfulness that's uh, going into this process. I did want to uh, query, uh, first of all, um, I think there might be a, um, a misprint at the uh, bottom of page three in the appendix where uh, under uh, this is a, a series of uh, initiatives that are underway and um, it um, under recreation it mentions recreating the village events 
but then talks about two swim events. Um, so I'm not sure if that's mistaken or not, because my understanding of the, is that the village is a is a um, an experiential pro program, and uh, uh, so when it talks about swim events, I'm not sure if it's somehow mixed up. So maybe there could be some clarification on that. Uh, um. uh, through the chair, that is correct. There's a, a, a training program uh, called the Villages, the Village. And uh, this was the title that was given to these swim events. And um, that was what the recreation group worked on with um, the Wachai Friendship Center. And I believe it was Recreating the village oh. was the title of this one event. Okay, well, thanks for clarifying that. I um, appreciate that. The other question I had uh, follows up on uh, Director Arbor's comments, and I'm just wondering if uh, if staff and uh, the um, uh, the group that's uh, that you're working with have any recommendations uh, regarding these two options. I think. It's, it's a difficult one. I think um, we put these two options forward to the board to uh, better understand and, and have the discussion about the board priorities because it is important for us to be able to dedicate the right amount um, of staff effort and resources towards this. Because if we are going to commit to building relationships, we need to do that in a way that's meaningful. Uh, the work that we've done with, with Comox First Nation has taken a lot of resources and it, you know, it needs to be that way in order to do a, a good job and to do this meaningfully. So I think it's a matter of, of having these discussions and um, you know, being open and honest about what our capacity is. Um, right now, our staff resources is myself working with Russell and um, you know, working with the managers here uh, throughout, the, throughout the department. So, I think that um, you know, uh, focusing on the the five nations would be at a maximum. Kind of doing the outreach that we would have um, capacity to do that. If it's not a priority for the board for this year, if there's you know not initiatives that the the board is feeling the need to focus on beyond what we've done already through and have. Um, proposed for 2023, which uh, is is quite a bit of work. Um, I think continuing at the at the rate of which we're, we're going right now, um, we have the staff resources to do that. Uh, if it's something that um, the board wishes to proceed with more work, then we would just need to look at uh, allocating the appropriate resources um, through staff or contracting. Thanks. I think that's fairly clear. I'll maybe just follow up by asking if um, if you perceive any potential uh, risk um, if we uh, opt for number one as opposed to number two. I think this is this is work that we continue to learn and evolve as we move forward. Um, so. I, I don't identify any perceived risk at this time. I think the work that we're doing with the advisory group is really, really valuable. It works with three of those nations um, that have overlapping land territory. So I, th I think that we are doing good work. Um, we have our regulatory process and we are reaching out to those nations where regulatory projects are involved. We have our planning referral process. So it's not as though we're not doing work with those nations. This would just be uh, if the board wished to pursue um, a relationship at a government to government level because I think that that staff to staff work is occurring now. Thanks, really appreciate that. And I'll certainly support moving forward with the option one. Um, just to add to the conversation, is it possible that we could maybe focus on those nations that we are um, working with in an emergency planning context? Um, those that we might receive as host community in, in um, case of emergency. I know when uh, Howie last spoke, he was saying that um, the best thing about running those um, um, emergency program um, drills was that people got to um, see each other face to face and therefore get some level of comfort if, uh, if an emergency did occur, that there was a friendly face um, there waiting. So uh, in, in that capacity, maybe um, 
myself and and other doctors can reach out um, from a, a political space uh, uh, to those other nations. Um, Director Hardy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I'm just wondering if there's an appetite to do some advocacy work with the province of British Columbia in regards to uh, acquiring more resources to do this very important work. I think, you know, if there was some door knocking undertaken with our MLAs to direct some more resources towards these two options that maybe that might be helpful moving forward. I don't know. Thanks for that suggestion. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, Christiane is also working on our um, our advocacy and the meetings with the various ministers that you've identified. And one of those is the um, Minister of Municipal Affairs. So that would be a very good point to raise with that minister is the work that is being done and the potential for support. So we will definitely make a note of that and have that for speaking notes for that meeting with the minister. Dr. Hardy. I'm just wondering again, uh, the CBRD is representative at the Comox First Nation uh, main table. If it's an item that could be brought up with Comox, Canada, and BC as well. And uh, I, I understand that the need to have that communication with uh, UBCM. I think it might be really important to also have those discussions with Mar. Good, yes, we will bring that up. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, thanks, Christian. So we are on receipt. All in favor of receipt? That's carried unanimously, and there's a recommendation. Move recommendation one with option one was um, moved by Arbor, seconded by Grant. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And Second. Recommendation two, moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor. And that's uh, regarding the grant funding application for urban communities partnering for reconciliation pilot. And it's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item 13, the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Grant. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grant. We're staff. Thank you very much. And Carrie McIntyre from our emergency program is here to present this report and answer your questions. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, an application that the Comox Valley Emergency Program has made with support from the CVRD, uh, an application to UBCM to the Community Emergency Preparedness Fund grant under the Emergency Support Services stream uh, for potential funding up to $25,000. Sorry, Madam Chair, if I could just ask Carrie, could you speak into the mic a little bit more? Thanks very much. Do you want me to repeat? No? Okay. All right, so this is a grant for $25,000 um, to support uh, the emergency support services stream. And if, we're success if we are successful, the emergency uh, management program will be providing um, the overall grant management. And I just wanted to add that this is an extension of the project called Hosting with Humility, which is already underway. And this will be a piece of that project to allow the off-island communities of Hornby Island and Denman Island um, to be more self-sufficient should the power go out and they need to provide services to residents there. So as you can see from the grant application, we're looking at to support them with some equipment, which might be, um, which will be uh, generators, uh, as well as some training and supports for their emergency um, support services folks that live on that island, on um, both of those islands. And that's all I have to say, if there's any questions. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Um, we do have Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I'm definitely in favor of this application. Um, the longest power outage I experienced on Horview was in 2008. It was seven days, seven days. So um, that puts things in perspective. And we did not have a generator, but we had a wood stove and cooked everything on it and uh, survived. But I, it's not everyone that has that capacity. And I think that especially looking at people at risk, household that uh, may struggle with some of those activities and all the rest of it, this is a great initiative for the island and glad it's being brought forward. Thank you. 
and we're on receipt. All in favor? Thank you. And there's a recommendation. Move it. Moved by grief, seconded by McCollum. Thank you. And it's that the board approved the application for the grant funding for the $25,000 hosting ourselves, hosting with humility. And it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? It's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item 14, information access and privacy protection board policy. Thank you, Rob. Chair and Directors, and Jake Martins, General Manager of Corporate Services, will present this report and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell. I'm Madam Chair. I'm here tonight to talk about uh, private information, but private information that can be publicly shared at this point. Uh, this report does respond to new uh, legislation, which has brought it, been brought into force on February 1st uh, of this year. Uh, it amends the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act to include new requirements uh, for local governments and all other public bodies. Uh, these new requirements are centered on two main part points, uh, providing mandatory privacy breach notifications to individuals affected and the Officer of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, as well as uh, the development of a privacy management program for the organization. This all comes uh, in the, uh, um, the, the light of uh, increasing growing threats of data breaches across public and private organizations. And I'm sure we can all think of a number of cases in which we've heard about these instances in the news. And so uh, many uh, provincial and federal bodies are, are bringing forward new requirements to try and curb this. Uh, however, it is a continuing growing threat. Uh, these new requirements do necessitate a number of new and strengthened policies and practices for the regional district, inclu including privacy impact assessments, privacy breach and complaint processes, personal information banks and a directory to collect all those and provide those to the public, training for staff and otherwise, and many others. Uh, the attached information access and privacy protection policy is, is intended to serve as that overarching framework in which all of these actions will be taken. Um, and while this policy doesn't require new uh, direct financial resources for us, it does require significant staff time and effort. And in that regard, I do want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Ashley Hawker, who's here tonight, is our, and she is our manager of uh, information and records, who will be leading uh, these efforts. As part of our review of this overall program and the new requirements, uh, we did consider the other change to the act, which took place, which was uh, the enabling of public bodies to apply a $10 application fee to freedom of information requests. Uh, this uh, new change has been brought forward uh, with a number of public bodies implementing it, others not. Uh, in our case, we are seeing a, a significant increase in the number of access requests and the very broad nature of those requests uh, and the staff time associated with has led us to recommend to the board uh, that such a fee be implemented. The Office of the Information and Privacy Commission has reviewed overall these the implications of these fees and does, has expressed some concern, but staff have reviewed the recommendations and we'll be putting forward administrative policy to help address this and ensure that our process is fair and transparent and that there are not uh, fees or other barriers imposed in an undue way. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'm pleased to respond to any questions the board may have regarding this. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jake today? Okay, I don't see any. We're on receipt of the report. Suppose the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thanks to Jake and Ashley. Sorry. Recommendation one moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant, and it's that information access and privacy protection policy as attached be approved. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to recommendation two. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Arbor, that the board consider three readings and subsequent adoption of the Comox Valley Regional District Information Access and Privacy Policy. Any further discussion? To vote the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to item 15. <laughs> Um, it's the proposed financial plan budget presentations, 2023 to 2027. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Grieve, I think. <laughs> and Kevin Devell, thank you very much. We've moved you to the desk. Thank you very much through the chair to the directors. Good afternoon. 
So this afternoon, we have six budget presentations for you today. That's inclusive of the transit presentation you received earlier. This brings us close to the end of this phase of our annual financial planning process. Uh, once we kind of go through the budgets of today, then we'll just have a few more budgets that will be coming forward to a couple of different committees in early March. And then once the period ends for the public uh, uh, feedback and engagement, we'll then be getting the process of rolling everything up and preparing our annual budget bylaw, which will be coming to the board for consideration on March 21st and March 23rd. So just up on the screen here is our annual financial planning process dashboard, just to give you a sense of kind of where we're at in the process. So you can see a lot of green there, which is always a good sign. And then of course, at the far right, we do have the number of budgets that will be presented to you today. So with that, um, I can certainly move on to the uh, first budget presentation at, at your leisure. Thanks, Lisa. So I'll be providing a short presentation on the Regional Feasibility Study Service, Function 150, and then certainly welcome any questions you might have. So of course, this is the service that's uh, available for undertaking feasibility studies uh, that uh, relate to any proposed regional services. Uh, these, uh, this is a distinct service from our electoral area of feasibility services that obviously look for uh, feasibility services or services um, that have more of that kind of electoral area uh, uh, view. Um, we do have a modest annual requisition here of approximately $15,000. That's been in place for a number of years. Uh, the exception was uh, the past two, 2021 and 2022, where we didn't have a tax requisition. That was primarily due to uh, the availability of surplus car uh, carryover funds that we were using to kind of fund the service at that time. Currently, we don't have any regional service feasibility initiatives included within this financial uh, five-year financial plan. Uh, what we do have included here is the uh, beginning of the annual repayment of feasibility funds from the new regional parks and trail service. So that is included across this five-year financial plan, starting with 2023, where we have that first payment of 21811 We will be reviewing the total costs associated with the feasibility with respect to the regional parks and trail service. And if needed, we'll make some adjustments going into next year's financial planning. Uh, the only other item that has uh, historically been included here is the Comox Valley Water Supply Strategy Implementation. Uh, this has been a long-standing item that has been in this particular service going back to 2009 when some community works funds were first allocated to this work, and I've detailed some of that uh, history in the, in the report for your uh, information. Um, however, given there is no, uh, no longer any outlook for use of the remaining funds, and we do currently have about $81,988 in outstanding uh, funds there, staff are recommending that these funds now be decommitted and made available back into the general community works funds pool for any other suitable projects that might come forward. So just quickly, here is the year-over-year -year budget comparison for the service. So as you can see, there's some modest uh, dollars still available to undertake any regional feasibility projects that may come up uh, over the course of the year. So right now we have just over $64,000 in unallocated uh, professional fee dollars that could be used if something were to arise. Uh, so we do have some capacity, uh, uh, you know, continuing. And that's really all I have for the service, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kevin. And we have a question from Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks. That's a pretty healthy amount for minor feasibilities, I guess. Maybe not major one. I'm just wondering why the, uh, um, I guess, is it because we're waiting for feedback from participants or from the participant from jurisdictions? Uh, the social uh, development grant, wouldn't that be an item considered as an expenditure in the budget this year, or is it because you still haven't collected the feedback you're not including it in the staff report? Um, Madam Chair, staff were thinking that um, it's a relatively simple proposal that may not need study work, but if in the event that it does, we, we have monies available that could fund it, we don't necessarily need to requisition for it at this time. Thanks. So uh, in my feedback then is what I did in the rural areas yesterday is I, I brought a couple of my feasibility um, 
budget to zero because there's no expectation of feasibilities in the near future. I feel like 67,000 is pretty good amount for with us having no planned uh, feasibility coming. I would mind bringing it to zero as well if I realize it's a bigger broad, broad conversation, but um, I don't know why we would requisition the 15,000. Um, maybe Kevin could speak to the implications of that. Uh, sure, through the chair to the director. So yes, as I noted, uh, in the past two years, we haven't requisitioned because again, we had limited um, uh, regional feasibility activity, save parks and trail service. And therefore, you know, we really didn't feel it was justifiable to to continue with that requisition. Um, this year, yes, we did bring back that requisition, noting that right now we would have about $64,000 in available funds. We certainly could curtail that requisition again. That would then limit further the 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 unallocated dollars that we would have uh, that would bring it into line of about uh, 40, you know, give us about uh, what's your 50, just under $50,000 that would then be available if we did need to allocate something to whether it's the social initiatives or some other map. Yeah, and being that this is a new board and we'll have our strategic planning in June, we might need those funds. We're not sure at this point. So I think that um, staff's recommendation is, is good. Any further discussion? Okay. We're on receipt of the feasibility service. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. There's recommendation. Moved by Greaves, seconded by Hillian, and that's that financial plan for feasibility service be approved. Any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. We're on to oh, one opposed. Director Arbor. Recommendation two. Recommendation two is moved by Hillian. Seconded by Grant. Thank you. And that's that the remaining $81,988 of community works be allocated to support that was initially allocated to support the Comox Valley Regional Water Supply Strategy be decommitted. Any further discussion on that? And it's a vote full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Okay, item 17. Oh, oh actually, I wanted to just test the board to see how we're doing for, um, <laughs> yeah, we do have sandwiches. Um, do you want to take the break now or? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll take 15 minutes then. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks. There is a standard. <laughs> On
Coming back to our seats. So we left off at number 17, the member municipality debt servicing function. Can I get a motion for receipt? Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. Thank you. And over to staff. Thank you very much again through the chair to the directors. So we have a very brief report on the member municipality debt uh, function 190 and then certainly welcome any questions. So of course, this is the services that really drives our member municipality debt. As you all may recall, municipalities are required to undertake their long-term borrowing through regional districts. So there is a process uh, that is outlined on the slide here that uh, municipal councils do have to kind of go through when they're considering any long-term borrowing. Uh, once that process has been undertaken, then of course the regional district will adopt a security issuing bylaw, and that does, uh, as also with the municipal portion, does require a certificate of approval from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. Um, really, the the driving force of this is there's no there's no tax requisitions or anything of that nature in this service. The really the sole source of revenue here is the municip member municipality debt servicing uh, that is recovered for the debt servicing costs. Um, and that is then provided to MFA. So as you can see here, the borrowing method is issue of debentures. That's done twice annually by MFA BC, uh, both in the spring and in the fall. And then of course the agreements are between MFA and the regional district, and then the regional district would enter into an agreement with the respective municipality. So with this process, regional districts are very much a guarantor of any of that municipal debt. So if that debt were ever to be defaulted upon, then it would behoove the regional district to have to support that debt. Uh, and, you know, now you know, we've met recently with MFABC and they've certainly indicated to us that's never happened. Um, but of course there is, uh, you know, kind of protocols and, and things put in place to, to ensure the integrity of this, this borrowing process. So this is just a bit more of a kind of a, a flow representation of kind of how this process flows. So uh, both for regional districts and municipalities. So as noted, you know, and I do apologize that it's a bit small, um, you know, basically a, a municipality would go through the loan authorization bylaw process that would be uh, required three readings. Um, it would then uh, have to go through a bit of a process uh, and caution period that would then receive uh, approval. And then they would kind of proceed and then bring that all forward to the regional district. We would then issue that security issuing bylaw and then bring that forward as such. So here's just a bit of an example of what's kind of going on in, in the member municipality debt service. Um, there ha was no new debt issues in entered into in 2022. So really, there is just a couple of kind of, um, you know, carry forward items uh, with respect to the city of Courtney. Uh, what's largely contributing to a uh, bulk of this is the Fifth Street Bridge project. Uh, with respect to Cumberland, this is inclusive of their uh, new fire hall project that was completed back in 2021. And then, of course, with the uh, town of Comox, uh, what's represented here, the $12,084, that represents the final year of their debt issue. So at the end of 2023, Comox will actually be debt-free, at least from a long-term debt perspective. So that's all I really have for the service. More than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Kevin. Let's see, Director Arbor has a question. Yeah, you can't put a slide like that up and not expect a question. So we'll will challenge you and uh, you're not allowed to look at your notes. What is the 10 days quashing period? So there is a period that is required at any time a member of the public could come up and contest that security issuing or in the case of the municipalities, the, the loan authorization. It is a part of the legislation. It's a requirement that uh, enables that kind of um, um, feedback period uh, assuming we do not get any kind of any such feedback then of course we can then continue on and finalize everything uh, through the ministry and mfa what happens if there is feedback from the public on then the we period? would um might have to what would happen <laughs> yeah we would definitely have to bring that that feedback to the board and then probably kind of restart the process from that regard. Good to know. Um, I was wondering, since there's no requisition, um, 
but there's obviously some administration that has to happen with this function. Is that coming from general administration? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we don't really charge anything specifically to this because really this is literally just kind of that debt management function, but certainly finance staff kind of oversee kind of the management of this. So, you know, we, we, you know, work with MFA to get those amortization schedules. We then make sure that is reflected in the service. But yeah, we don't, we're not charging any, any direct administrative costs to this particular service. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so we're on receipt and I don't see any further lights. So all in favor, any opposed, that's carried unanimously. And there is a recommendation. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Cole Hamilton, and it's that we approve the member municipality debt servicing function financial plan. Any further discussion? It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to item 18, which is a financial plan for victim services program, Crime Stoppers grant contribution, Comox Valley Community Justice, the cemetery and Comox Valley Airport Service. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor, and over to staff. Thank you very much again through the chair to the director. So again, a short presentation to speak to these four services. Um, this is um, a combination that we have brought forward to you in the past, just given their, their nature and the relative stability of each of these services, but I will certainly be providing kind of some highlights on each and then certainly welcome any questions. So as I just noted, these services tend to be very stable and therefore we're bringing these once again collectively for your consideration. Each service does support a, a pretty key community partnership or initiative with a local agency commission or local government within the uh, Comox Valley Regional District area. So just quick highlights on each for victim services. Um, you know, the, the primary cost associated here is the operational grant with the Comox Valley Transition Society for victim services. Uh, we did recently renew that agreement, so that agreement now expires at the end of 2024. Uh, there was a modest increase from 22 to 2023 of $6,000. This is largely to keep us in line with the provincial contribution that they also receive. It is part of what the province is really looking for uh, to ensure that uh, the local government is contributing something relatively equally. Um, this particular service also does include the Comox Valley Crime Stoppers, and they continue to receive an annual support of $12,000. They have received that, that amount for a number of years. Um, I did have a conversation with them earlier in this year, and they're, they're more than happy with that amount. They say they, uh, that they don't need anything more at this time, uh, but we'll certainly continue to kind of look at that as time goes on. Moving into community justice, uh, function 205. So again, operational grant agreement in place with the Comox Valley Community Justice Center. Uh, that agreement was recently renewed or was renewed back in 2019 and therefore we're in the final year of that agreement, 2023. Uh, I did actually recently receive an email from the new managing director for the Community Justice Center. So we will be connecting shortly to start having conversations around a potential new contract. Director Hillian, do you have a question around community justice? Uh, yeah, I have two questions, actually. Thank you, Chair. Um, the first is in relation to uh, Crime Stoppers. Uh, do we actually get a report uh, from them indicating uh, their level of activity? I've heard some rumors that they're not very uh, active these days. Uh, through the Chair to Director Hillian, um, I'd have to investigate that. I'm not certainly aware of seeing any report from them. I mean, part of their their annual budget submission, I mean, we do receive just some some general uh, updates from them. So I can certainly take a look back through that information and, and certainly bring that forward for you. It would just be interesting to know because uh, in our meetings with police, we don't hear much about uh, what's going on. And if, if they're not doing anything, then I can understand why 12,000 a year would be perfectly adequate. Um, my other question, though, was uh, in relation to the uh, Community Justice Center and in the notes um, in the report, um, there's an indication that um, the, um, uh, the projected 2023 tax requisition, uh, hang on a second here, I got the right one, yeah, it says it's, um, it's a $2,000 increase from 2022 due to the last prior year's surplus carry forward being available. What does that actually mean in relation to the Justice Center? 
So we fund that through this particular service. So there's a number of other costs in addition to the operational grant. If we do find that we um, you know, aren't, haven't spent the full allotment in any given year, then we would bring that surplus forward into the next year, which means that we could either use that to fund additional activities within the service. It could be used to, to offset any kind of requ uh, requisition increase, or it could go if a reserve was available to, to reserves for um, you know, future potential costs. Right. And you mentioned that the um, new director has been in touch and you're going to be con conversing with her. I, I, I suspect that's um, to talk about the possibility of increase, increasing the amount. Uh, is that a possibility? That could definitely be a possibility. I mean, we did do a modest increase with this latest five-year agreement. So I would certainly expect to be having that conversation with them at that time. Thanks very much. Thank you. We have another question from Director Arbor. Yeah, thanks for following on Dr. Grant. Um, I think it may be good to invite Crime Stopper to come and present to the board on their work. And, and uh, we did that with, uh, we kept giving a property tax exemption to Sunnydale Golf Course. And every year we grumbled about it because like, we don't know <laughs> if we're subsidizing rich people or what is happening with that. And finally, we said, let's invite them to find out more because we don't know very much. And it was super informative and interesting conversation. So I'd say maybe let's invite Crime Stoppers and find out what they're about. We can Good idea, thank you. We can certainly reach out. Okay, I don't see any further lights. Please continue, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then moving on to cemetery service, function 400. Um, this supports the various cemetery works that are undertaken annually by the city of Courtney, uh, including the purchase and installation of uh, two niche walls. Uh, for 2023, so those, sorry, those two niche walls were works that were undertaken last year. Uh, with respect to 2023, uh, we have included $208,000 here at their request to uh, look at putting in 104 new lawn crypts within the uh, municipal uh, cemetery facility. <laughs> And then lastly, with the Comox Valley Airport, function 795, this service has existed largely as a conduit to support the debt servicing that was undertaken back in 2003 for the airport expansion. Uh, as I've noted in, in previous uh, presentations for this budget, uh, that debt is now slated to retire in October of this year, and then the, that debt will be fully repaid. Um, and therefore, at that point, um, you know, I guess we'll we'll need to decide what the future of the service will be. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Exactly on that. Like, um, obviously, I, most of us were not around when the agreement was put in place, probably 20, 25 years ago or 20 years ago, maybe. Um, so I'm just curious, our relationship, if we have any... So is it just a general contribution that we debt service or do we have any liability or obligations in regard to the airport? So for example, if they have an asset management plan, like, and they wanted to improve their GHG or anything like that, like, do we have an obligation to the airport or is it just a one-time contribution debt service and after October, it's really up to us whether we want to stay engaged or not? I, I don't have that information. Uh, through the chair to the directors, I'm certainly not aware of any outstanding obligations that we would have at that point. We really, you know, we're playing kind of the the sponsor of, of that debt. Uh, they continue to own all of those assets. They continue to manage all of those assets. We we really don't have any direct obligation with that, that capital infrastructure. Um, but certainly, you know, some conversation may be warranted with the airport commission as to what their future outlooks are. Thank you. And just quickly, just wanted to provide the year-over-year -year budget comparison for each of these services. Uh, so as you can see, uh, a small increase or, uh, in victim services of about $10,000 in the requisition. That's largely due because we do have a little bit less prior year surplus carry forward available. And we are seeing some of those operating cost increases that I noted earlier uh, with respect to community justice. Small increase there of $2,000. Uh, again, largely driven by the fact that we are bringing over less prior year surplus, um, and we uh, are seeing a pretty stable operation operating budget, uh, just a $204 increase, um, and it's still continuing to put some dollars away into this services particular reserve. 
with respect to cemetery. Um, that $30,000 requisition increase is largely driven by that, that increased capital works um, timeline that the city has provided. Uh, we do also supplement this pretty significantly with, with transfers from reserves, as you can see there. So we're pulling about $60,000 out of the uh, future expenditure reserve for this service to help offset some of those capital works as we've done for a number of years within this service. And then that supports, you know, largely the general operating there. Given the uh, number of, of capital works uh, proposed this year, we we aren't putting the dollars into reserves, but we do have allocations in subsequent years to start replenishing that reserve once again. And then lastly, with airport, as I said, this is the kind of the final year of this particular budget. So we have fully brought in the remainder of the reserves uh, here, because if it was the board's desire to wind down and repeal the service, we do need to make sure that those reserves are fully expended. So that's why the small decrease in the requisition here to uh, ensure that we can fully bring in those reserve balances. And then, you know, really some minimal operational costs. That's really just a, a minimum support service charge. The the rest of it is the debt service and costs, and those are those are fixed. And that's really all I have for this one. So more than happy to answer any other questions that there may be. Okay, thank you, Kevin. I think the questions were sort of asked through the presentation, so I don't see any further ones. Thanks again. So we're on receipt. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Sure. Uh, grief and grant move the financial plan for the victim services that it be approved and it's about the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, Hillian and Arbor move recommendation two and that's that Comox Valley Community Justice financial plan be approved. Again, above the full board. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Um, Cole Hamilton and McCollum moving at the financial plan for the cemetery service approval. Um, this is area B, Courtney and Comox. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Uh, Morin and Arbor moving recommendation four, which is the Comox Valley Airport Service financial plan approval. And this is with the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And that brings us to item 19, the Regional Growth Strategy Service Financial Plan. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor, and over to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Alana Malaley is here, General Manager of Planning and Development Services, to present this report with the help of her staff. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, through Madam Chair to the directors, um, we're here tonight to present to you the pro posted proposed budget for the Function 512 being the Regional Growth Strategy Service. Our approach with this report tonight is a little different. Rather than bringing you a recommendation regarding the posted proposed budget, we're bringing forward a draft for you to consider in the context of a preferred scope for an RGS review beginning in 2023. So momentarily, Robin Holm will run through the posted proposed budget with you, and she will describe the proposed 2023 projects within the service. Robin will then turn it over to me, and I'll talk a little bit about the RGS review scoping process that we went through this fall, <clears throat> excuse me, with the uh, RGS Technical Advisory Committee and the RGS Steering Committee, and I will introduce you to our preferred scope for an RGS review. So presenting in this way, it is our intention that you have an opportunity prior to the recommended budget phase to provide feedback on this um, uh, preferred approach that's being put forward by the Technical Advisory Committee and the Steering Committee. I'd now like to introduce Robin Holm, our Manager of Long Range Planning, to present the posted proposed budget for the Regional Growth Strategy Service. Robin? Through the chair to the directors, Function 512 is a key service to guide the regional planning and decision making in the Comox Valley. 
All municipalities and electoral areas, with the exception of Demon Island and Horby Islands, participate in the service. Staffing within the service is 3.4 FTE with a 0.65 FTE vacancy. This continues to be a lean service with a big output. As a service, the RGS focuses on study work, data collection, and collaborative planning. We are continuing to build capacity and understanding among staff and the board to work on very complex issues. This requires identifying key partners and collaborating on the work as much as possible. As a bylaw, the RGS provides a framework to manage growth regionally through land use designations and supporting objectives and policies. The estimated tax impact for a property assessed at $800,000 is $15.12. This compares to $12.60 for a property assessed at $600,000 in 2022. Over the last year, we've been able to advance a number of initiatives and projects that focus on prioritization and implementation. 2022 work accomplishments include the ongoing administration of the Wood Smoke Reduction Program. In 2022, the CBRD aligned its program with Clean BC's Better Homes Rebate Program, focusing on switching wood burning appliances for an electric heat pump. Last year, staff issued 15 rebates out of the province's total of 28 for wood stoves to heat pump switches. In May 22, 2022, sorry, staff brought forward the draft strategy from the work of the Airship Roundtable and received direction to come back with revisions. The RGS Performance Monitoring Dashboard was launched in 2022 as a tool to track progress towards the eight goals in the CBRD's RGS. Performance can now be evaluated on an ongoing basis. Staff have been working with a consultant on preparing a community-wide GHD emissions inventory all the required data has been collected and the draft inventory is complete. Following up on the, trans the work of Transition 20 2050, staff have been working to prioritize implementation actions in the Residential Emissions Reduction Action Plan that will help the CBRD work towards its 3% residential retrofit target. And finally, to advance the Active Transportation Network Plan, staff have initiated the process to prioritize projects for implementation and grant funding. In terms of the 2022-2023 comparative budget summary, revenue within the service is primarily from tax requisition. And in order to undertake the proposed work plan and projects that align with the priorities of the board, the proposed requisition is 550,000, which remains the same as 2022 and 2021, uh, with an additional 73,000 in senior government grant funding. In terms of expenditures, there is a modest increase proposed in personnel costs and decreases in our proposed operating budget and contribution to reserve. Carry forwards have not been calculated at this time, so expect to see this number increase once the budget has been finalized. Now, moving forward to our 2023 work plan priorities. Uh, project plans have been attached as appendices to the staff report, and they provide details on all of these projects, including budget details. I'll just uh, provide a quick update on the status of these projects, which you've just heard about from our 2022 work. A staff are working to update the dashboards uh, for the RGS monitoring dashboard. This is to incorporate the 2021 census data, which has now all been released. GHD emissions for reporting years 2018 and 2021 will also be updated. Staff are finalizing the inventory uh, report on the GHD emissions with municipal partners and will be bringing forward the results to the board along with recommended actions. In the Residential Emissions Reduction Action Plan, implementation actions will focus on both retrofits and with the addition of new construction. Key areas of focus will include transitioning away from fossil fuels, in particular oil heating, through incentivizing heat pump installations, establishing a, collabor a collaborative network, uh, such as an intergovernmental climate action working group for Comox Valley local government staff, exploring fin financing programs to further incentivize retrofits in lieu of PACE. Staff attended the first Vancouver Island Coastal Communities Regional Peer Network meeting on February 1st. This is a peer network that connects staff from local governments on regionally relevant climate initiatives and provides opportunities for partnerships. This is particularly timely with the launch of the Local Government Climate Action Program from last summer. 
building on the findings of the community-wide GHD emissions inventory and further to your resolution from January 31st related to strategic planning, staff will scope a climate action strategy that identifies best practices in local government climate action, GHD emissions reductions pathways, and a community engagement process. The strategy will present a reduction scenario that includes mitigation actions, estimated costs, and the resource and time required to achieve the CBRD's GHD emission reduction targets. Staff will bring forward this scope for your consideration in April 2023. Staff continue to administer the wood stove reduction program, and with the 73,000 in senior government grant funding for rebates, staff will also work to um, promote and provide outreach in 2023 for this important project. And later this spring, staff will bring forward an updated strategy on air quality that responds to the board's feedback from last year. Oh, sorry, and finally, the Active Transportation Network Plan implementation will be focusing on identifying three to five projects that help connect our core settlement areas by creating a network in the valley. And for the two resolution on, on January 31st, staff are working to secure partnerships and funding to advance this implementation of these projects. Staff will bring forward the results of this prioritization exercise later this spring. And I would like to hand it over to Alana Malali now to speak to the RGS review and the work that has been done to scope the options for an RGS update. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robin. Through the chair to the directors, um, Lisa, may I ask please that you pull up, thank you. <laughs> if you could, if you wouldn't mind scrolling up to page four, just above there, please. So in the context of considering a possible five-year of the RGS, last spring you directed us to report back with some scoping options for you to consider. So to that end, over the course of five meetings this fall, we convened the Regional Growth Strategy Technical Advisory Committee with the assistance of Alison Habkirk to consider some potential scope options. And we began this exercise with questions uh, such as what are the critical issues facing your communities and how could the RGS help to address those issues? What are the strategic priorities of your councils and the electoral area directors, and how might an RGS review serve to respond to those priorities? As a technical advisory group, we asked the team, uh, and having worked with the RGS over the past 10 years, we asked the group whether or not they saw any gaps in either policy, evaluation, and or implementation tools. We had good engagement and lively discussion uh, that included both planning staff and engineering staff at various points, and we kept returning to these same messages. One, the RDS bylaw is working. Two, there are no significant gaps in regional growth strategy policy, uh, for example, that would preclude action on any of your strategic priorities. Three, the land use designations remain relevant and they are responsive to the housing needs and population projections that we've undertaken and that have just recently been released by uh, Census Canada. And four, implementation of the regional growth strategy bylaw should be a priority over the next five years. So as a TAC, we took that feedback to our steering committee. As a reminder, the steering committee comprises of four CAOs, and uh, we met with them earlier this month. In Appendix A of your staff report, um, you will see three scope options that we presented to the steering committee, including rationale and proposed budgets for each. So scope one option is no amendments, status quo. Scope option two, these are targeted amendments to update the RGS bylaw that could be considered using a minor amendment process, and I'll come back to that. Scope option three is a comprehensive amendment that could be considered using a standard amendment process. So together, the Technical Advisory Committee and the Steering Committee landed on a preferred scope for an RGS review. And for tonight's meeting, I'd like to walk you through that preferred scope, including a related budget, which can be accomplished within the posted proposed budget that Robin has just described. So preferred option, scope option. I should note that the steering committee took measures to um, consider the following. They, they considered the strategic priorities of this board and their respective councils and found that there is an existing policy basis in the RGS bylaw as written to support work on the priorities, on your priorities. 
We talked about the uh, receptivity of the public to engagement and landed on the idea that specific targeted engagement on implementation items is likely to be better received by the public at this time and could be more meaningful in its impact. We also talked about the availability of staff and resources and suggest to you that resource constraints would likely preclude optimal participation in a comprehensive review of the RGS at this time. And lastly, the steering committee considered the feedback from the TAC, which again was that the RGS bylaw is working, there are no significant policy gaps, the land use designations remain relevant, and that a focus on bylaw amendments would likely protract the implementation of key actions that are already contemplated in the regional growth strategy. Lisa, I must have goofed here. So I'm looking for um, in Appendix A, page four of eight, and it's yeah, uh, that's right there where, where those Roman numerals are under preferred scope. So given these, all of these considerations, the steering committee suggests to you the narrowly defined scope focused on the amendments one through nine listed on this screen would serve the interests of both the service participants and the public and would enable a focus of staff on implementation actions, which would include targeted public engagement. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so just to walk through, um, you can see me squinting in with my glasses. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thank you. So uh, in the first one, there's some requirements of the Local Government Act for regional growth strategy bylaws. And one is population and employment projections. Your RGS has to contain that. So we would suggest that we have the data based on the 2021 census to do that and then to do some modeling work. So that would be the first thing we would suggest. We would suggest that we also update map number five. This is that boundary map that shows you the land use designations. And the update that we would suggest would be made there would rather just to be to redraw the municipal boundaries based on the um, incorporations that have occurred over the intervening years since adoption. So not um, making any uh, amendments other than what already exists lawfully. We also suggest to you that we would update language in part two to reflect Comox First Nations treaty process. If you had a look at the regional growth strategy lately, that setting the stage context piece uh, speaks to the process that was you know, in place at 2008, 2009 when the RGS was drafted. And we would include reference to the board's indigenous relations strategic driver, just so that you can put a stamp on this RGS as being yours and informed by the current context that we're in. Uh, number four is another requirement of the Local Government Act, and that's updating the greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction targets. You'll recall that Robin just spoke to the fact that we've just done an inventory, um, and so we're in a position to establish pathways working with you. So that's how we would accomplish that piece. We would also suggest to you that we use the RGS hub, the dashboards that Robin just spoke to, pull out the indicators that are in the bylaw right now, house them in the hub, and then update them as we get data. So they'd be more of a living tool uh, versus what they are now enshrined in bylaw. Um, we would also suggest to you that we would update the policies in part three only to the extent of modernizing or correcting or updated. For example, there are references to organizations such as the Comox Valley Economic Development Society. Um, we would remove those. We would remove language. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's key one we'll focus on. We would also apply the board's Indigenous Relations strategic driver to the language used in part four. This, this reference here, 4.1c, please read that as part four, 4.5.1c. That's a very minor piece, uh, but again, it references where we were in 2008, 2009, where the nation was with the, their treaty um, work. And then um, we would also suggest that we just make a, a deletion of the reference to uh, Sage Hills everywhere that appears, both in map and text. Very straightforward. This might seem major because it involves changing a land use designation, but what I would suggest to you is that the RGS already contemplated that by having an expiry clause on the um, policies that pertain to Sage Hills. And then finally, in part five, which is the implementation section of the RGS bylaw, we would add reference to action plans in order to achieve each of the RGS goals as an implementation tool. Thank you, Director Helene. I'll just speak a little bit about um, those action plans. 
So as I mentioned, over the course of the TAC discussions uh, this fall, CBRD staff um, identified the potential to develop action plans that would support the implementation of the existing action items in the RGS bylaw. An action plan would set out the pathway to work towards each of the eight RGS goal statements. And these action plans would be developed in accordance with your strategic priorities. The action plans would have a five to seven year time horizon and would be responsive to board direction as well as community input. We would develop metrics for the action plans and we would include those in the regional growth strategy hub uh, and update them regularly so that both you um, as decision makers and then certainly staff and our public could monitor our progress. Um, <clears throat> And so essentially these action plans would be the tools to help advance both regional and municipal priorities and coordinate efforts across the region, which is wholly contemplated within the existing RGS bylaw. Based on your feedback to date over the course of the last um, couple of years, we would suggest that a climate action plan would be the first to be developed. Um, and Robin gave you a little bit of a hint about, about that work. Uh, followed potentially by a housing action plan. But certainly the prioritization of action plans could be further fleshed out in your June strategic planning session. In respect to public engagement, we know this is really important. And so we suggest that targeted engagement on implementation of these specific goals in the regional growth strategy in the context of an art action plan is likely to generate public interest and in turn meaningful opportunities for participation and input. Lisa, would you please scroll down a little bit to that table on page five? The minor amendment process, thank you. So the preferred scope that we're suggesting to you tonight, uh, staff is suggesting that this could be undertaken using what's called a minor amendment process. So just to back up, um, the Local Government Act provides two process types for a board to undertake or consider any amendments to its RGS bylaw. The two types are either a standard amendment process or a minor amendment process. A standard amendment process is the process that's required to, an adopt, to adopt a regional growth strategy bylaw and to undertake amendments for anything um, that is not minor. A minor amendment is defined in our RGS bylaw. It's ultimately the board's decision on whether or not a proposed amendment is, or, pardon me, on whether a proposed amendment is either minor or standard. Briefly, the key differences between the two process type boils down to the extent of consultation and the requirement for a standard amendment to be accepted by all affected local governments. And it's the Local Government Act that defines what constitutes an affected local government. In our case, this is the member municipalities, this board, the board of the Regional District of Nanaimo, the board of Strathcona, and the board of um, the Alberni Clayqua Regional District. A minor amendment process can be undertaken, and this is spelled out in our RGS bylaw, can be undertaken for text and mapping amendments when a proposed amendment does not, in the opinion of the board, enable a specific development to, to occur and is not of regional significance. So in this table here, just you know, as guidance, um, I've prepared this table to give you a sense of the process steps and the related timing of a possible amendment process. So it looks like a lot of steps. A standard amendment would have many more. Some key highlights in there. A minor amendment, you establish a consultation pro. Oh, you know, I should just remind the board. Only the board can initiate an amendment to the regional growth strategy. So, um, you know, here we are talking a little bit about scope. We can do that again next week if you wish. Um, and then in order for that process to begin, you would have to pass by resolution, uh, an, um, an initiation resolution. And then we would kick into uh, notifications, the development of a consultation process, uh, including consultation with the technical advisory committee and the steering committee. We would then suggest to you that we would um, work with Comox Chief and Council to understand what their interests might be in participating in a regional growth strategy amendment. And then we would make a board, or pardon me, make a recommendation from the steering committee uh, to consider the amendment formally as a minor amendment. And then you would determine at that point, uh, and we've got there June, um, the proposed type and the scope, and then we would start the consultation work. Um, 
within the local government act, there's provision for you to consider whether or not you want to undertake a public hearing. So that's something we would talk to you about. We would talk to you about how you would want to consult with COMOX um, chief and council, and then certainly with the other uh, nations, some of whom um, Christiane referenced tonight. And then we would start to look at um, bylaw amendments, proposed amendments in the fall, uh, introducing a bylaw for readings, and it's the same as any bylaw requiring three readings prior to approval. You have the option to include a statutory public hearing or not. Sorry, there is no statutory requirement in a minor amendment. You've got that option to consider whether or not you would do that. And then ultimately, uh, with the kind of scope that we're, we're talking about here, we would suggest to you that you could have a bylaw adopted um, in about a year, a little over a year, if all went well. So in the um, context of preferred option, of this preferred option, we suggest to you that we could do this for a budget of $65,000, $55,000 in 2023 and $10,000 in 2024. So what we would spend the money on. So in 2023, we would spend about $10,000 on population and employment projections. So to have some modeling work done. We would spend about $5,000 on communications, and that would be primarily done in-house, for example, like our web page, we would use we would use that. We would provide statutory notifications, sort of bare minimum. Um, we would use a consultant, likely for support in doing public outreach, and we would suggest that a budget of about $30,000 would be required to do that. And then we would do CVRD in-house mapping uh, work, and that would require a budget of about $10,000. In 2024, we would uh, put about $10,000 aside to have a legal review of the proposed amendment bylaws. So this is a modest budget. It's a modest scope. It's a modest budget, but altogether doable with the existing resources. And most importantly, uh, is, staff is of the opinion that this would absolutely achieve the kinds of things that we've been hearing you talk about that are important to you in terms of implementation and action. So if this scope resonates with you, then our next step is to come back to you next week on March 7th with a recommendation to approve the posted proposed budget. And then we'll return to you again in April with a recommendation regarding initiation of an RGS amendment. If, however, we have missed the mark, based on your feedback and direction tonight, we will still come back to you next Tuesday, but we'll be coming back with a revised budget that contemplates a broader scope that addresses your interests. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we do have some questions already, starting with Director Grieve. Thank you very much. Um, my concern is that this looks like another rubber stamp to me. I was, I was there when the bombs were falling, and I can tell you that the RGS was designed basically to appease the major municipality. Um, it served them well in a lot of cases. And I'm looking at the engagement here, and I see, you know, three different opportunities for engagement with KFN, but nothing with the electoral areas. Um, you talk about the three municipal CAOs plus regional district. Well, um, and, and the steering committee, um, was it how how were they chosen? Where did they come from? So I, I'm just concerned. I mean, we got uh, settlement expansion areas that are that are uh, right now. I mean, if you look at the population growth, there's actually less than ten percent going outside municipalities. It's actually eight, I think. So we aren't even hitting the ten percent mark. I think that we have to hear from the public. To say it's optional is is ludicrous. Um, if you look at the recent recent growth strategy, was there some of the language in there around the uh, the four hectare minimum makes it impossible with anybody less than eighteen acres of land to subdivide, except maybe through a, a five fourteen, but I mean an actual subdivision of that land. And you can see in certain areas that um, the the language actually read at one time should be for hectares, which was changed in the final draft as shall be. I think one time we spoke of actually revisiting that because there are some property owners in the uh, interface areas with the municipality that are sitting on, you know, maybe um, 
they don't have they don't have eight hectares, but maybe they have seven hectares, and they're frozen in time. Um, also, the document reads that uh, servicing through uh, servicing will be provided through annexation into the municipalities. Well, you know, I don't see the municipalities rushing to annex anything these days with the cost involved. So I just want to know who is speaking for one third of the population, four fifths of the land mass at the regional growth strategy table. Thank you, Madam Chair, to the directors. So the steering committee is your four CAOs, right? Um, and the steering committee is established, it's written about in the existing RGS bylaw. So that's who you're hearing from. That's those, it's those trusted advisors from whom you're receiving recommendations about scope, about amendments. The technical advisory committee, historically, that was the planning directors for the four jurisdictions or the planning managers. But what we recognize, having worked with the RGS over the last 12 years, is that it's really important to have the right voices at the table based on the technical expertise that's required. So um, in our process this fall, we engaged both planning and engineering staff to talk about the regional growth strategy and in respect to growth management, in respect to infrastructure and servicing uh, and developing complete communities, which is what is contemplated in the regional growth strategy. So that's how we came up with that. Certainly, you know, if there are other persons or sorry, other professions, individuals within the municipal um, organizations or, or here at the CBRD, then we would look to bring those folks to the table because the goal is that we're providing feedback to our CAOs in order to give you recommendations. Your point regarding the urban rural divide, I, I get it. You know, I'm a planner in the rural areas for the CBRD as well as, as um, well, actually, when you look at the budget for the RGS, my role isn't even picked up in the regional growth strategy. So um, I think that over the, the years of working uh, with the regional growth strategy in the rural areas, I think we are really tuned in to what the concerns of rural constituents are. And I can say that at our development counter, we rarely hear from rural residents who want development in the rural areas. Rarely do we hear that. We hear that from the individuals who might have an interest in subdividing their own property. That's absolutely true. And so in that, you, you know, you recommended some of the tools that we can offer to those folks within the context of growth management. So I think, you know, we are live to the issues that are happening in the rural areas. We're live to the uh, issues that are happening in the municipalities. We've looked at the OCPs in the municipalities and our own. We've looked at all of the study work that we've done, you know, over the last several years. Um, to understand what those concerns are. And, and our suggestion to you is that the through implementing actions in the regional growth strategy, we think we can respond to both your priorities and the interests that we're hearing in the community. A follow-up, Director Grief. Thank you. Yes, but with all due respect, there's nobody speaking for the electoral areas. We've got, um, I mean, we have a, a, our CAO here, but he wears hats of all the municipalities and, and the electoral areas. So there's nobody specifically speaking. And nobody, I mean, there are maybe some people that want runaway development in, outside the municipality. I don't think there are very few, but what I think needs to be recognized is what is existing in the development, where we have areas with very urban sized lots next to larger acreage, and the person's frozen in time in large, larger acres. What we see is uh, um, growth being, uh, uh, Put into the municipalities, which which is is good because it's it makes sense. Smart growth makes sense, but there should be some acknowledgement that what we've done is increase the price one heck of a lot for the average person, and we're not getting a, at least a little bit of of, of growth um, in in the in the rural areas. Like I say. The business of servicing through annexation is an outright lie. It's not going to happen. So we have to address that. I would say that we need, at the time that we had the original region growth strategy, I was the vice chair and I was actually elevated to, to, with the mayors because I spoke for the electoral areas. But we don't even have an electoral area um, chair or vice chair right now. So there's definitely a disadvantage. I think it has to be recognized that the rural areas want in. They don't want wild growth, but they want a little bit of that stuff. 
So I, I don't agree with this plan at all. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is staff's recommendation and staff for the regional district take all the participants' interest in consideration and making recommendations. Director Grieve, this is the start of the process by which you, the politicians, give your perspective and you as a collective give us direction. But bear in mind on something such as an RGS, it's going to take a consensus of the participants as to what the process is moving forward. And just with respect to servicing, a great deal of time and effort is being spent by the regional district to ensure sound quality servicing for the rural areas. We're working on services to the south. We continue to work on opportunities for growth in the settlement area to the north in Saratoga. And progress is proceeding at Mount Washington, the three settlement areas within the rural areas with sound servicing. Thank you. Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I I also represent a rural area, and I I, I guess I'm not seeing uh, what's before us is here or the situation in the rural areas as dire as uh, what my colleague from Area C described. Um, and and I think I think there may be a different conversation to be had at EASC because in addition to the RGS, we are potentially working on our OCP this term in the rural areas, where I think a lot of the comments and concerns of Director Grief can some of them, not all of them, but some of them can be best addressed. Um, our OCP is also quite old and is in need of an update. So for me, part of my mind in regards to this particular service, the regional growth strategy and, and the update, it's like the two minds, right? What comes first, probably the same thing that Courtney and Cumberland, and everyone who's redone their OCP is facing. Um, and what I didn't hear is which option was preferred by Director Grieve, like no action, blow up the RGS, or just option one or two or three. In my case, sadly, um, I think staff did too good of a job in option three in describing the basket of goods that we could potentially have. Um, you know, it's it's how fresh do we want? And and what jumped at me is, you know, in option three was clear, revised to reflect applicable articles from the Declaration of Rights and Indigenous People, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Convention Action, and the Comox First Nation Treaty Process. Those are good things that I think we should do. I'm kind of fearful of an RGS that right now we make minor changes, but in 10 years, it will look really old. <laughs> You know, whereas I think that in option three, for each of the goals, there's a serious modernization around our goals and our the data that we have and the objectives that we have. Um, that I'm I'm quite my my preference, even though staff did a really good uh, job of pitching the option two as a more constrained and and minor amendment. Everything I read in in action three I was like, yeah, we should do that. Yeah, we should do that. Yeah, we should do that. I was like, and you only do it every 10 or 15 years. So um, that's my feedback. Director Hardy. Thank you. Um, just a few comments or, or questions. Uh, first and foremost, again, uh, looking at the report, I didn't really see much in regards to uh, new growth nodes being explored in the regional growth strategy. So I'm just wondering if, if that's being contemplated here. Um, next question or, or comment would be, I know BC is introducing new housing legislation and just kind of trying to wrap my head around whatever legislation that BC is gonna put into place with regards to housing, is that gonna require some changes to the regional growth strategy and are those being contemplated right now. Uh, in regards to engagement, uh, again, I know from, uh, from Area B, we're just putting together our electoral area uh, planning committee for Area B. So there's a number of folks that'll be sitting on that committee. And my concern here is, again, with regards to the technical work that's being undertaken here and the engagement that's being taken here that maybe that engagement should also include the the rural or areas a b and c uh committees uh, planning committees so i'm just wondering if that's 
I, I didn't really see that in the plan. So I'm just wondering if that engagement is going to happen. I'd hate to see a regional growth strategy with, with changes and recommendations being put forward without any engagement with the rural planning committees. I'm also wondering about the agriculture planning committee. And, and again, is there engagement with that particular committee and the work that they're undertaking right now? Is, is that being integrated into this uh, service or, or, or this strategic planning moving forward for the RGS? And then I know um, during my campaigning and during my knocking on a number of doors, a big concern that I heard from a number of developers and contractors within Area B was again, uh, their involvement in the regional growth strategy moving forward. And I think these folks do bring a lot of technical support and perspectives to the CBRD if, if we're open to listening to them. So I'm again, just wondering if there's a, an appetite to engage with these folks uh, moving forward. I, I would think so. And uh, I guess one final comment, uh, and there's no disrespect to the staff here because they do a great job, but this, to say that we haven't heard any concerns or issues uh, with regards to development permits, et cetera, I think uh, Monday's East meeting was a pretty good example of, of uh, a delegation coming forward and saying, uh, we, we see that there's some, some gaps we see there's some concerns and issues with regards to policy and regulation, and how do we go about addressing that moving forward? So again, I have heard from a number of different folks, and I think we even voted on uh, a Piercy Road home uh, under 514, uh, uh, having first and second reading. So I, I think there are folks that are putting forward issues and concerns with regards to the RGS, and uh, I don't think we have to look too far. Thanks. Thank you. Um, for myself, I was um, looking through and I didn't, um, I wasn't sure about um, the depth to which we would um, talk about our commitment to United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and whether that uh, commitment um, you feel could be addressed within the realm of a minor amendment. Um, I know that um, Cumberland, Comox, and uh, the electoral areas are all looking at redoing their official community plans within this term. And that uh, each of those documents then needs to align with the regional growth strategy. So if we're um, looking at a path forward as far as reconciliation, it, I really feel it should be in, enshrined in the regional growth strategy and then have those um, other OCPs feeding into that. The other thing I didn't um, see too much on was um, the floodplain management. And we've got um, some good reports um, coming back um, to the regional district. And then um, Comox First Nation has also done their own floodplain management studies. And um, of course, that would um, specifically direct growth away from certain areas. And I'm just wondering how much that has um, been planned for within the um, preferred minor amendment. Thanks. Through Madam Chair to the directors, I think uh, between yourself, Chair Kettler, and Director Hardy, there are a number of things that I, I wouldn't mind responding to if that's okay. And I'll just start where you left off. Uh, the commitment to UNDRIP uh, and, and to implementing the Act. I think that um, Robin will have some more comments on this for sure, but I don't, uh, you know, the litmus test that we looked at with the RGS bylaw is we said, this does this bylaw preclude anything that you want to do? Does this violate in conflict with any of the OCPs? Does it seem to be running aground of the strategic, pardon me, the strategic direction that you provided around this table? Does it run aground of, um, of things like the Draft Housing Supply Act? And we found that it doesn't. We found that everything 
that uh, you have identified that you would like to do, the things that we see on the horizon, the concerns of our development community, the concerns about new development in, in hazardous areas. There is a policy basis for action in the existing bylaw. And that's why we come to you, not because the RDS is perfect, not by any stretch, although it's pretty darn good when you start looking around the province to see you know, the approaches that other communities have taken. Our RDS bylaw is really sound. To Director Arbor's point about the longevity, we wrestled with this. We thought, oh, gee, if, you know, if, if we don't, you know, embark on this exercise right now, what does that mean in five, six years? Does it mean that we've got this really archaic document that hamstrings either this board, the electoral area directors, or the municipal councils? And our suggestion to you is that it does not. There is enough in there. And this is where I probably have not done a good enough job in talking about what we've received for those action plans eight goals in the RGS, right? And so our suggestion to you is that we would have an action plan for each of the eight goals. The goal statements are very broad. So to come back to uh, Housing Supply Act and uh, our growth boundaries, the RGS says that we need to provide a diverse range of affordable and appropriate housing in locations that make really good sense in respect to uh, infrastructure planning, asset management, and hazard. Like I'm, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but that, but that's where it points to us. So I, I, we we're sort of at a, at a loss as to what would be missing there in in terms of you being able to act to respond to the interests of the development communities, both in the rural areas and the municipalities, in response to new legislation. Um, so in those action plans, that's where we can suggest uh, that we, you could define. Those are five to seven year sort of time frame plans the pathways, the steps that you want to take, the, the, um, the actions that you want staff prioritizing. It would be within those bodies that we would suggest you would do that work. Um, so, uh, Director Hardy, the question around the, the draft housing, or the Bill 43, the Housing Supply Act, will that require any change to the regional uh, growth strategy? We would suggest that the fact that we have a regional growth strategy puts us in a really good position to be able to respond to that Housing Supply Act, which ultimately says provide appropriate, affordable housing in the places that make good sense. And we suggest to you that the core settlement areas do that. Um, the engagement scope. Uh, not for one minute did we suggest that conversations wouldn't need to be happening at the Electoral Area Services Committee or at the council tables. I just didn't get into all of those specific things because step you know, 1C is for you to adopt a consultation plan, for you to tell us what is the consultation that you want to be undertaken relative to the scope that you define. So absolutely, we will be coming to those tables. Um, your, your strategic planning sessions, both the EASC strategic planning in April and then the board in June, that will give us, you know, that's an opportunity to give us really good feedback. Um, the development uh, community concerns, we hear those loud and clear. We hear that they're concerned about turnaround time on applications. We hear that they're concerned about overall costs, projects, you know, inflation. Um, and we would suggest to you that as staff, we are doing other things outside of this bylaw to try to be responsive to that. Um, the floodplain management piece, the, um, the Robin talked a little bit about how, you know, we've already shared that work. We've got some uh, other projects in the electoral areas that we have on the books and we know the municipalities do too. But the policy basis for action there is, we would suggest you already in the RGS. Don't put new development in these areas and try to mitigate the risks for the development that's already uh, in those areas. Robin, do you wanna add anything about the under piece? Um, no. Sorry, not in particular about under, but I was thinking a bit about the floodplain management. We are planning on coming forward with an update to the floodplain management bylaw. And I really would um, suggest that that is the appropriate tool to be able to manage that risk. There is policy in the RGS right now that directs development away from hazardous areas. So it really is our authority in the flooding bylaw that allows us to designate that area and to establish flood construction levels and setbacks. So that, I think that is the appropriate tool for that piece. Um, I also did want to add that in our action plans, 
we really see this as being um, an opportunity to really focus on developing those, those um, mechanisms and pathways to really get these projects off the ground that have been identified in the RGS. We can identify uh, who should undertake what and really identify um, where we have an area of influence. So I think that that's where we can really flesh out whether advocacy is our role to advance a certain action or whether it would be to strengthen the regional context statement and really flesh that out in those action plans and really focusing on what we're trying to achieve. So I look at that as being an opportunity to really focus on, on the implementation rather than policy. Great, thank you. We do have a couple more questions. Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thanks for this report. And I think um, maybe the, one of the challenges I think I'm experiencing and maybe others are too, is that option three is incredibly clearly spelled out with, with what might happen. And they're generally things that many people around this table think are, are things worth doing. And as I understand you saying about option one, uh, choosing option one is not to say that we're not going to do the things that are listed in option three. What I understand you to be saying is the regional growth strategy already allows for those things to be done. Therefore, we don't need to change it um, in order to develop the action plans that we're going to develop and actually have them happen. I think the challenge for decision making here is, is, is option three is incredibly clearly laid out in terms of specifics, whereas option one is about action plans. And we obviously don't know what those plans are right now. But um, but I'm, I'm what I understand from from the report and from you is that we will be working with staff to develop those action plans, which can include any of the items that are listed in option three, but we'll be specifically saying this, 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 and this, and then a plan will be developed on them. So by choosing option one, we're not saying that the issues- Option two. Oh, sorry, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the eight goals as well. So I got too many numbers in front of me. Um, thank you. Uh, that, uh, that, Yes, by going with option two, we're not um, precluding any of the things listed in option three. Uh, we're just, um, they're just not quite as clearly uh, perhaps listed or or, um, or spelled out. Uh, so option three is, is very specific, whereas option two is less so, but option two contains any of the possibilities. So I think I've repeated myself a couple of times there, so hopefully I've caught that. Do you want to respond to that? <laughs> thank you very much, Chair Kettler. Um, thank you for articulating that much in a much clearer way than I did. And, and that is exactly where we landed, that you can do all of the things, I think, that are in here in the way that we conceived of them. You might have different ideas uh, about what they are. So we would want to flesh that out. I guess the other thing I should say is like, we're here tonight just to give you a bit of um, something to chew on in the context of the budget for the service. So if, if you said, okay, staff, we'll kind of, we'll go along with you, what you're saying, maybe for option two, on the basis that we're going to really get into what we want to do through those action plans uh, for the purpose of this budget. And then we got into the process and at June strategic planning or April EASC planning, you said, aha, here's some other things that we really didn't think about or staff didn't flag for us that we want to embark on like this, this process doesn't have to end, right? You could, you could then say to us, staff, we, what we really want you to do is uh, come back to us, either say with a budget amendment, because you found another source of funding to uh, do some of this work, to do a broader scope, or, or we want another shot at this for the 2024 financial plan. Um, you could absolutely do this. So this isn't your, you know, your one shot. This is really just our effort to try to get something in front of you for the context of, of this uh, financial planning period. Thank you. Dr. Arbor. Yeah, thanks. Um, just on, on second round here. Um, I, I mean, it's such, it makes me worried. It's such a strong case for option two that I wonder why staff even puts option three on the table, because I think staff is really defending option two here. And so maybe I would have preferred not to see option three at all. <laughs> you know why? Because it's honestly like it's rare that you're putting yourself out there really for in favor of one option. And uh, and I'm still with option three. I think we left it too long. I think after 13 years, the proper process, if you wanted to option two, is we should almost mandate ourselves or find a way to mandate boards to review this every four years. Then it'd be very easy to do minor amendments. 
the start of a term, a new board, you refresh the RGS, you make minor amendments. I think that's if we're going to try to start and pick and choose from the list of all the goals, you know, that's going to be actually a lengthier and more messy process than if we embark on it in a comprehensive review right now, because we won't all agree on which goal should be changed or what should be pursued. And I'm not driven by, after 13 years, I'm not driven by actions. The actions will happen across our services in different ways in the RGS. I'm really dr driven by is the data, are the goals relevant, are they modernized, are they, and it's, all those things are, are clearly is. Dr. Cole Hamilton laid out in, in option three, what would happen? And I see an extra hundred thousand dollars for an exercise 13 years later to, uh, you know, for a document that I think, uh, as Chair Kettler said, option three would be more likely to really inform, I think, our OCP exercises of the three municipalities. The other one is, is more like, a, slightly of a tinkering with a number of, of action plans. I, I don't want to diminish that, but even the full throw uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, pitch for option two, I, I still feel we should do it, but then in the future, we should do it more regularly because then I think it would look more like option two. Thank you, Director Kerr. Thank you, and uh, you know, thank you for this report, and and thank you for all three options to consider. I'm I'm glad they're there. I mean, I really like option three, but the sticker shock of the cost is is obviously paramount. Um, it would would be nice to see all of the elements in option three. So my question is, what what would option two point five look like? Is there something in the middle where we could have it look like option three, not cost as much, um, be more streamlined, but not quite go the whole the whole way. Um, is there a hybrid option, something in the middle that we could all be happy with? Uh, through Madam Chair, uh, we did wrestle with that as a talk and steering committee. Like we want, we didn't want to be disingenuous and, and bring you two options and say that's the full breadth. So that's where we landed. And um, in respect to a 2.5, I think what, you know, we really tried to look at was being true to the concept of the process of the review. So a minor amendment really is, is that, right? It's, it's that set of amendments or individual amendment that you can undertake without the feeling that you are changing the goalposts or changing the ball game for, um, uh, for the region in respect, whether it's growth management or um, targets or, so, uh, you know, we, we could put our minds to that, but I think a 2.5 would punt us immediately into the standard amendment, which has cost and timing implications that are significant. Madam Chair, I'd just like to add that I think that uh, recognize that an RGS standard amendment is like a sledgehammer. It's a very good tool, but it's not the tool that you would use to carve a roast beef. And uh, I think the, 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 what is proposed through the action plans enables you to use an effective mechanism to engage with the public, engage across the board with municipalities, electoral areas, APCs, ag committees, or otherwise to address the specifics of those eight objectives and find actions that you can implement in the next few years, as opposed to a more prolonged RGS, very legislative process of cons uh, consensus building within to come up with your terms and conditions and engagement with the other regional districts. It's a weighty process. And so I think this is 2.6. Option two is that it's getting both the best of both worlds, really diving into specific actions on the objectives to get something in, in place, but do those minor amendments through through a, a, uh, an efficient and effective process that also enables those partners, those municipalities that want to do an OCP amendment to proceed with that once this is all done within this term. Because that sledgehammer approach, that 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 standard amendment RGS will take a great deal of time through your term in order to get that done. So just some suggestions. Thank you. Next we have Director Hillian. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, th th that's one of my biggest concerns, the amount of work that uh, whatever option is chosen uh, will uh, impose on uh, um, in our case, the city of Courtney staff, and I think we've heard really clearly uh, from our staff uh, what they've got on their plate already with the implementation of our official community plan. 
um, if the other municipalities are in fact doing official community plans, then uh, believe me, you're in for a ton of work. And uh, to add uh, a complex and, uh, and convoluted bureaucratic process of, uh, of a standard amendment on top of that, uh, it's pretty significant. So that's what's going to be guiding me here along with uh, the staff recommendation. Thanks. Director Grant. Yeah, thank you. Well, when I read this, I thought that option two was the hybrid. You know, I think it gives you the ability to do everything you want to do in number three, but you don't have to go through quite the weighty process. So I saw it that way, but I'm hearing some concerns out there on land use. I don't see land use as one of the goals. So if you could maybe add that, that would give area C and area B the opportunity to have their say on the land use piece that we're doing. But also, um, like we in Comox are, we're landlocked right now, we're stuck. If we want to play a significant role in the housing issues that are going on, we're going to have to expand our boundaries. So in, in question two, Edwin's concern is, yes, we are actually looking actively at, at expanding our boundaries right now because otherwise we're where we are. Um, we also have a planning process going on right now, OCP review and regional growth strategy all at the same time. So it gets really onerous for us really quickly here and they all tie together. So I guess I was viewing number two as the hybrid use. And, and my question would be, um, is there an area where we could put, like you've got housing and stuff, but could we put the land use piece in? Because I know Edwin's got, and he's had concerns since day one on some of the land use and acreage sizes and stuff. So that's something that can come up during the discussion, I would assume. Through Madam Chair to the directors, I think you know land use is contemplated throughout the the RGS bylaw. I think you know in in the context of, of parcel size and subdivision, that's really about growth management, and um, you know the, the reference to expanding boundaries. So that the RGS makes provision for that, right? That that the municipalities can expand into what's called the settlement expansion areas. Those are those areas on the fringe that were identified as being good candidates to receive growth when the municipalities have built out and need more land. Um, so, so that can happen. The town can can do that, and and we've seen that. Courtney's done it. Um, Comox has already done it. We've seen that. In respect to changing the the development picture for rural residents, that's not minor. That is uh, looking at the growth management scheme. And if that's uh, the desire of this board, then I then I would suggest to you that that is likely a, a different uh, kettle of fish. Thank you. Next, we have Director Arbor. You know, it's funny when you're down five to three in the third period with a minute left, and then there's two empty goals, like uh, empty net goals, and you're back at five five. For the standard uh, amendment, learning that Comox is looking at boundary extension right now, that leads me to absolutely think we should do a standard amendment. I mean, looking at the catastrophic uh, excursion of uh, Courtney into my rural area with the uh, ridge development and kind of uh, unplanned, un, unsought, uh, unconsensus expansions of municipality barging into rural areas. If there's any discussion around settlement expansion right now, we should go into a standard amendment process and, and have proper discussion amongst, amongst elected officials. Any response from staff? Uh, through Madam Chair, so the, the Comox's OCP identifies the settlement expansion areas into which they will grow first. So, you know, if the expansions that the town is is looking to um, apply to the province for are within that framework, then that's fully contemplated in the existing regional growth strategy. And then sort of managing the impacts of that in our rural OCP, we've got some language around how do we manage that interface, right? How do we work on communications? Um, how do we mitigate some of the conflicts that, you know, that, that have happened that we've seen when, when those annexations occur? If the town is looking at expanding its boundaries into areas outside of the settlement expansion areas, which based on conversations with staff, I, I don't think is the case, um, then, then we're not aware of that. <laughs> okay, so we don't have a recommendation for tonight and um, there's obviously not consensus about how to move forward with the options. Um, what is staff's thinking around what will be brought back? 
Uh, Madam Chair, am I hearing that the board would like a little more detail as to what could be achieved through the action plans and to, to demonstrate the, the activities that would be would transpire in that option that reflects um, some of the commentary that's provided in option three? And that we would bring that back to the next meeting? That sounds good. Director Cole Hamilton. Thank you. And one other thing I think would be useful is, uh, to me, one of the most persuasive uh, arguments in favor of option two is that option three might end up delaying a lot of the work that we're trying to do and tying up staff who could be getting at things. I mean, I appreciate uh, the points being made that, that, that cost is important, but really, when you're looking at a document of this importance, um, which lasts for this long within the scale of the CBRD budget, the price difference between the two options is less than $200,000. And I, I don't think that should be the factor that's that's moving us one way or the other. But I would be very inter interested in hearing what the sort of the, the, um, the impact on staff capacity would be of option two versus option three, if that could be spelled out a bit in the report. In the report coming back. Yeah, and if we put off um, the standard amendment for another five years, let's say, is there a feeling from staff that at that time there wouldn't be the same demand on staff time with all these other projects and not like, will we continually push it off um, for the same reason that um, staff have a lot on their plate? Through the chair to the directors, I think, you know, you know, the constraints piece, the resources piece is, is really central to this discussion, but it's not the only part. Like the abiding message that we have is our suggestion that the RGS bylaw, although it's not perfect, and, you know, there are concerns with some aspects of it, on the whole, it's working. And so that's why we're suggesting to you that there's nothing that you need to do with that bylaw right now. Um, certainly you could. But I, th I think that we would come to you with a recommendation via TAC, via steering committee, if we identified things that were uh, in conflict with, you know, the context of, of what's happening out there or legislation or, or things that we were hearing from you about your um, direction to staff. Okay. Director Cole Hamilton. Oh, two more questions. <laughs> Director McCollum, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's not a question that's just gone around for a while, so I feel like maybe I should chime in with my thoughts on this as well. I'm, I'm in support of um, option two. I think there are some good arguments to be made for doing a deeper dive. I just, I don't think the timing is, is ideal. And I also think back to when um, the Courtney Council was looking at uh, an OCP review and just how frequently we would talk about policy and bump up against how out of alignment the current OCP was about things that we're trying to implement or do. And I just have not seen that occur at this board. So to me, that is a very good case for just having having a lighter look at it, doing something that's a little uh, more concise and still doing some level of engagement without, um, yeah, without opening this up so broadly, especially if there are other OCP reviews happening um, in, a, in our municipalities and in the electoral areas. Um, it's a lot to ask the public to continuously engage on these issues. And I do think the OCPs um, are probably uh, a higher priority, just given that we haven't really seen a real conflict, as, as Alana was saying, in terms of what the RGS um, outlines and, and the direction that this board is trying to go. So just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Director McCollum. Next, we have Director Hardy. Yeah, thanks. And, and again, I get and understand uh, some of the comments have been put forward by staff and from some of the directors here at the table. Uh, again, for us to make a decision in regards to option one, two, or three, again, with us looking at developing our planning committees, our agriculture planning committee, and, and getting some input from the development community, I think it is important that we get some outsiders 
from the, the inside technical group of the municipalities uh, providing some input with regards to what their thoughts would be in regards to option one, two, or three. So I, I get and understand the important work that staff does here, but it does it serve us to also get another opinion outside of, of staff in regards to what it is that we're looking at with these options. The, the, the people that are out there living and breathing uh, the regional growth strategy that have to adhere to it, it would be interesting to, to get their input uh, in regards to this regional growth strategy. Thank you. I guess further to that staff, if we started community engagement um, under the direction of a minor, but then we found a lot of the feedback really was moving toward a, a major amendment, would we be able to shift gears at, at that time? Through Madam Chair to the directors, absolutely. So this is meant to be an iterative process. And I would suggest to you that you might not know at the outset exactly what you want to do or certainly what your residents are interested in, in having considered and looked at to Director Hardy's point. And, and fair enough, I think um, you would absolutely have the opportunity at any, pull, at any point to pull back. I should also note that in order to proceed as a minor amendment, something needs to be voted on um, in the affirmative by two thirds of the, the folks who are at the table. So that at that point is certainly a step where those flags could be raised. Thank you. Next we have Director Moran. Great, <clears throat> Great thanks Chair. Yeah, I haven't weighed in either. So, I mean, I'm, I'm also supportive of uh, everyone's getting their options mixed up. Option two rather than I mean, certainly option three, uh, I agree it has some attractive language in it that's enticing, but I think um, as our staff has said, um, you know, we haven't had major issues with the RGS and it certainly aligns with what Courtney's been trying to do in terms of um, keeping costs down for services and also directly um, addressing the housing needs assessment. Um, we know that the type of housing, uh, we have a, we may get forced by the province to, um, to actually be more uh, radical than we're being in terms of, 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 you know, the RGS that we have now, because um, we have a crisis in housing and um, expanding out is obviously not the solution. And, um, we need to look at the type of housing that meets that those um, those needs that were identified in the assessment, and unfortunately, those needs are not generally reflected by subdivisions with, you know, one to two, three million dollar homes. Um, so, um, I'm I think the RGS is working well. I, I like the option. Um, reflected here and and it would be great to hear more about some of the action plans that we can do and what we can um, maybe and you know shift a bit but um, I certainly don't like the idea of, of opening it up and changing it substantially because it doesn't reflect the needs of the community it, it doesn't address cost all those other factors so um, climate change all the things that we've been um, talking about and and have been reported on um, many studies done lots of evidence we have a housing crisis um, we can't afford to just keep taking services out of the core areas so that's my comment thanks thank you okay i don't see any further lights and i think we've given um staff a lot to go back with thank you to both elena and robin for answering all our questions tonight um, it's a vote of full board and we're on receipt. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Okay. We're on to the Comox Valley Tourism Service. Oh. Um, moved by Arbor, seconded by Grants. And we'll thank, over to staff. Thank you, uh, Chair and Directors. And Lisa Kilpatrick is here to present the uh, budget for the Tourism Service and answer your questions.
Good evening through Madam Chair to the directors. So um, I'm presenting for function 550, which is now the Comox Valley Tourism Service. So the purpose of this service is to, in a nutshell, to provide tourism and destination marketing and visitor information services. This thing is the bane of my existence. There we go. Uh, so the town of Comox starting this year participates via service agreement. And we have a new um, participant in the service and that is the village of Cumberland. The Comox Valley um, CBRD staff alloca allocation is 0.25 FTE. That's 0.25 of my time. And then uh, the bulk of the, the work is done by our contractor, which is 4VI. They are currently under contract until the end of uh, December 2023. A key piece of the service is the visitor center at 3607 Small Road. The land and property is now owned and maintained by the service. This is a new asset to CVRD requiring repairs and mechanical upgrades and um, I think with the with the acquisition of any new asset, you've got to take a look under the hood, so to speak, for a little while to figure out exactly what's needed. Um, and we're still in the process of, of, of doing that and assessing the needs of that property. Um, just noting that this service does support an, an electric vehicle charging station at the visitor center. And for 2023, um, the impact for households assessed at 800,000 is $9.68. So for 2022, the main piece of work was the establishment of the, the service, the conclusion of um, the service review and uh, the creation of a capital reserve. As I mentioned, the village of Cumberland has joined the service and the capital project of completing the restoration of the visitor center exterior wood siding and restoration of the green roof has been completed. For 2023 work plan priorities, um, we have the tourism strategy development, which we are currently scoping out, and we'll be bringing the book to the board uh, for more information uh, later in March, hopefully. Um, within that strategy development, we're going to be uh, looking at exploring the, uh, the expansion of the municipal and regional development tax regionally. Um, we will ask for VI, our contractor, to present the 2023 Visitor Information and Destination Marketing Work Plan to the board in March as well to give you more idea of what's happening within um, the, the tourism services and what the plans are for the summertime. And then, uh, as I mentioned, we have looked under the hood and uh, we need new heating and cooling system at the center. The center currently has no heat. Um, we are running on, on uh, supplementary heats and baseboard heating. There's a nice fireplace that's trying to, to warm up staff. But um, so we've, we uh, are installing a new energy efficient heat pump system. And uh, that is happening hopefully starting next week. So just uh, some of the key pieces on, on the uh, posted budget, and uh, that is that the tax requisition is an increase of 57,911 over 2022. And this is, uh, I think, Kevin, uh, as you stated earlier, um, this is as a result of lower um, carry forwards than we had in our, pa in our past year. 15,000 in surplus is being carried for from unspent planning funds, and that will go towards the, um, the tourism strategy development. Highlights from the operational budget include approximately 90,000 for visitor center, that's on uh, maintenance, utilities, um, security, insurance. And again, as we get to know the building, we get to understand how we need to operate it more efficiently. So the the hope is certainly with the new system that we'll see some decrease in, in those costs moving forward. Uh, the contract with 4VI is for $50,000. And then we have 50,000 earmarked for the planning processes. The visitor center debt payment is in year two of five against the 365,000 um, mortgage that we assumed from CVEDS. 
And so we hope to have that, well, we, we the plan um, indicates completion of that, um, that debt by 20, the end of 2026. And then what is not noted in the posted budget um, that is a recommendation within the report in front of you is for $40,000 in capital plan for the replacement of the HVAC system that I mentioned. Any questions? Thank you, Lisa. Yes, we have some questions, starting with Director Cole Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And thanks, Lisa. Um, I guess something that really stood out to me there is that uh, we're paying 50000 to for BI, and I think we're getting great value for money. They've provided some really impressive material. Mm -hmm. But we're also spending almost twice that amount on just keeping the visitor center kind of limping along and not leaking and without heat. And um, I'm just wondering uh, what if we have a sense at this point of what the end game is for, or for the visitor center, because we're, we seem to be sort of bleeding money on an annual basis there. And I know that uh, no one's pleased about that. I'm just curious if we have an end game insight as to how to resolve the issue of the visitor center because that's clearly our largest single expense in the service mm -hmm. uh, so i think i'll come at that sort of uh two ways one is uh that the service reflects the cost of, of the building the cost of our, our contract with 4vi what it doesn't necessarily reflect is the total cost of the service and what I mean by that is, is in terms of the, the delivery of tourism information services and destination marketing, we have other funds that are coming into that um, from MRDT as well as from DVC. So we actually leverage this service in order to be able to access additional funds. 4VI also applies for funding on our behalf. Um, so they receive funding for summer students at the visitor center, they also receive a, approximately a twenty thousand dollar grant to support the servicing at the youth center um, for staff. So, um, what you see in front of you is is not necessarily the full the full picture, and and that will be something that you'll see through the presentation from Four Vi when they when they bring um, more information on their twenty twenty three plan. I think uh, in terms of the, the visitor center, certainly we heard loud and clear through the service review that we needed to consider mobile servicing. So uh, part of the plan from 4BI is certainly to, to continue with that mobile servicing um, in the communities. And then as part of the tourism strategy, we are going to hear what the community needs and once we have a sense of what that strategy is, what the actions are necessary, we can then contemplate um, what infrastructure is needed. And that, I think that will support the, the future look at, at the, the building. I think we also need to recognize too that, um, that we are uh, worrying in, in conversation with Comox First Nations in terms of their interest in that facility. And that we are we are hoping to enter into further conversation with the new chief and council about that. So so um, certainly the question is is warranted. There's a few ways that we'll be looking at what the future of the facility um, entails. Is there a follow up? Um, thank you, and I appreciate the context. And um, I, I think. Uh, I can see why we're certainly waiting to see if we can finish the conversation with Comox First Nation. But in, in terms of us determining what kind of facilities we we want uh, to deliver tourism, um, I'm not sure we've had a vote, but it seemed to be a fairly consistent opinion around this room, this table, that this is probably the visitor center is not the right way to go, but you're suggesting we need a more like a, a longer process to make that determination that it's not, uh, going to be a, a key part of how we deliver um, visitor services. So that's not yet being determined. Is that what, is that what I'm hearing? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, so th that, that's correct. Um, it's not staff's recommendation um, at this time to move forward with a disposition of, of that asset. Um, I think that once we understand uh, sort of the full interest from community on the direction of, tour of the tourism 
um, service and, and the future of that service, then we can uh, make a full recommendation to, to the board on what to, to do with that asset. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing that. Thanks, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Next, we have Director McCone. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I had a similar question uh, around the visitor center and, and just why we're not seeing um, a timeline in the um, work plan in terms of revisiting that asset. It was, I think, um, I don't, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but it was my understanding that we put a pause on it. And part of that was because there, there was an election coming up and that we didn't want to make a decision about a major asset right at the end of a term. Although everything that came forward from that service review, I would say was supportive of looking at, as you said, um, disposing of the asset. So um, in my mind, I had an expectation of seeing some type of planning around that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting that, you know, the number one item would be initiating a plan to, you know, uh, alleviate ourselves of an asset that is causing um, a fair amount of expense to the service, but at least some um, beginnings of uh, the process of looking at um, what what the best strategy is for it. And of course, um, if there is a dialogue happening with uh, Comox First Nation, then that would inform um, timelines and um, giving time to respond. But um, as, as far as the board knows, we just received a letter with no timeline and just, um, uh, yes, I, I can't actually remember if that was in camera or not. Is that a public letter? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> my apologies. Anyway, I'll I'll uh, stop expanding on that. But yeah, just I, it would be um, useful to have a better understanding of exactly when we're going to do some further analysis on the the visitor center. Yeah, Madam Chair, I could just say that um, two things: the determining the the uh, the function and uh, role of tourism in the valley, and whether a visitor center of this nature falls into that, and a candid conversation with Comox First Nations to see what their interest is in it. Those two items will come back and inform us as to recommendations for the board. Okay, thank you, Director Morin. Yeah, I mean, I think that partially answers my question. I guess I'm curious whether for VI, um, when, you know, we did have some discussion way back about these mobile um, services. And um, I'm just wondering if they're kind of, if it, well, they or anybody is doing a kind of a <laughs> feasibility we talked about earlier. Maybe that's not the right word. Um, but taking a look at comparisons and um, the uh, effectiveness of those models, I've traveled a fair amount and many, many places have these kiosk visitor, um, you know, big cities to smaller communities. And I think it is a way to, um, you know, even places like uh, obviously um, the municipalities, but even other other areas could have that kind of service that that um, would create, um, I guess, you know, this little hub uh, in terms of rather than it being out of the way. Anyway, I guess I'm just wondering whether anyone's been doing any comparison with those models and if we're going to be hearing anything about that in our conversation that our CAO is, is talking about, um, because it just seems yeah, that we need to take a, a better look at how we're delivering visitor services. Thanks. Absolutely. So for VI, this is their second year of um, of capturing the data. So that they're they're capturing the data from their the mobile interactions, and also capturing the data from the visits to the visitor center, and and they can certainly present that um, when they come in March. They are looking, um, you know, last year they they were able to deliver the, the mobile services in one way. They learned a lot. Um, they learned uh, in terms of, of, of where the tourists are and how they're interacting and the information that they want to know. So they're, they're, they're making some adjustments to this year. So certainly it's a, it's a learning process. Definitely. Um, as, as we move into the, the tourism strategy development, 
part of that piece is, is looking at some innovative practices um, on tourism uh, servicing and uh, which will further inform um, the idea of that, you know, the bricks and mortar place. Um, so I was just wondering, we've done the siding on um, the main part of the, the wooden um, siding on the building. We've redone the um, living roof. We're now putting in the new um, heating cooling system. Is there much more in repair or have we just done all those things that we needed to do? And so we won't, you know, to um, quote Director ha Cole Hamilton, be leaking, you know, money on this building other than the regular operating. Um, because I know that there is interest in leasing it. So I guess once it's up to um, standard, then there is a, a an option of a revenue source from the building. That was my understanding. Yes, that, that's correct. I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, however, there's only hopefully so many things that can kind of go wrong. And uh, the <laughs> no, you're right. Not, not good. Um, so I, you know, at, at this point, I, I feel that um, the the staff that are working at the visitor center and managing the Sephora VI staff, they have a really good handle on on that on the space now. Um, and certainly through the the replacement of the HVAC. Um, I think that's going to go a long way. And so uh, we didn't budget um, any more significant expenses uh, because we don't anticipate any. However, we do have a 10,000 uh, contingency in the operations budget um, in, the, in the event that something does come up. But it, the, the center is, is looking good. The outside is looking good. Um, we've got great contractors that are, that are um, supporting the maintenance of the space. Great. Thank you. Oh, Director Grieve. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. So if a, a Starbucks or a Serious Coffee wanted to move in there, who would they talk to? I mean, if this was run by a business, we, it wouldn't be a dead loss. There'd be something going on. I mean, we even talked about leasing out the, the boardroom there, but you know, we're, this is government. We lack those, those instincts. So I just wonder if somebody did come forward, um, would they come to the RD office? Is that what they would do? Or, um, or talk Chair, to Vancouver, uh, Tourism Vancouver Island? Madam Chair, the uh, board adopted a policy where we make the, the facility available for local organizations or otherwise so that we can offer it to the community. So that's available. So if somebody wants it on a one-on-one basis, come and see Lisa. Uh, in terms of somebody wanting long-term, we need to have a conversation with Comox First Nation and then come and talk to us or them as it turns out. Thank you. Okay, so no further lights. And there is a couple of recommendations, but we're on receipt for now. And that's a vote of ABC, Courtney and Cumberland. So all in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried. Second. Recommendation moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor, and that is that the proposed financial plan, capital plan for the tourism service be approved. Again, it's the vote of the areas, Courtney and Cumberland, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, recommendation two, moved by Hillian, seconded by McCollum, is that the capital plan for the tourism service, including the expenditure of $40,000 for the HVAC, be approved. Any further discussion? All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. We are on to bylaws and resolutions. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Kevin DeVell will just come and explain this correction to our security issuing bylaw that's required. Thank you for the chair to the director. So yeah, the staff report and subsequent bylaw in front of you is uh, due to the fact that, uh, as you may recall, back in uh, in January 24th, uh, the board adopted bylaw 745, security issuing bylaw, 
that included a couple of items pertaining to the Comox uh, Strathcona Waste Management Service, and also with respect to uh, Union Bay and the conversion of the Royal Bank debt to uh, MFA debt issue. This is, I guess, a bit of an example of the security issuing bylaw process at work. Uh, so once that budget was adopted, uh, it went through the 10 day question process. We then submitted everything to the ministry for their review. During the course of that review, they did uh, uncover an administrative uh, adjustment that they've asked us now to understand take. It's certainly not um, um, you know, affecting the integrity of the bylaw, nor the, the amount of debt that we'd be putting forward, nor the terms. It's literally to identify those two items that are in the uh, table on top of page two uh, with respect to the amount already borrowed and the borrowing authority remaining. So they've just asked us to make that change. With that, uh, what would be required is we'd uh, the board would have to rescind adoption and third reading. Uh, bring forward this this amended change, proceed with final adoption of the bylaw, we would then undertake that 10-day that question period again, and then hopefully at that point receive the certificate of approval from the ministry in time to continue to get this into the spring debt issue with MFA. So that's really all I have at this point, but I'm certainly willing to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Everybody understood that. We're going to rescind and then adopt the new one. Okay, so uh, all in favor of receipt. And that's unanimous. There's recommendation one, moved by Arbor, seconded by Grant, and that is to rescind the adoption and third reading of bylaw 745, Regional District Security Issuing Bylaw, and then give third reading and amendment to 745 as attached to Appendix B. And so the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? It's carried. Um, the next one, the rec recommendation two, is um, final adoption. Um, we moved third within the uh, first recommendation. Okay, moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. And again, it's a vote of the full board for adoption of bylaw 745. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, we're on to bylaws for first and second reading. Starting with bylaw 740, the Royal Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw. Moved by Grieve, seconded by Morin, and it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moved by Grieve, seconded by Morin for bylaw 741, first and second reading. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. For first, second, and third reading, bylaw 748. Second. Moved by Arbor, seconded by Hillian for first and second of the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Local Service Area bylaw. It's a vote of area C and D. <laughs> uh, all in favor? <laughs> and for third? Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor, and Unani unanimously voted on by Director Grieve. So, uh, bylaws for first, second, third, and adoption. Uh, bylaw number 754, the Union Bay Water Service Parcel Tax. So, um, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant for first and second reading. It's a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Grieve and Grant moving third. All in favor? And adoption uh, moved by Grant, um, seconded by Arbor. All in favor? Oh, sorry, Director Grieve, go ahead. I will not be supporting doing first, second, third, and adoption the same meeting ever again. Okay. Thank you. So uh, opposed, Director Grieve. Okay, and bylaws for adoption. Uh, we have the 735, the Black Creek Oyster Bay Fire Protection, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. It's both full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. We have adoption um, of bylaw 746, the King Ho Water Service Parcel Tax Bylaw, moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant, and it's voted full board, all in favor? And that's unanimous. And then we're on, on to the uh, Advisory Planning Commission bylaw. 
Moved by Arbor, seconded by Hillian. It's a vote of the areas only. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Bylaw number 751. It's the Agricultural Advisory Planning Commission bylaw. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. We're on to new business, new business notice, public hearing for bylaw number 740 and 741. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Arbor. Does staff want to speak to this at all? No, just standard. Okay. Just standard notice for public hearing. It's a vote of the areas for receipt. All in favor? Okay. And there is a recommendation. Yeah. Which area is it again? So I'll move that. Uh, what electoral area are the zip rezonings? McQueen and Blackburn Stewart. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'll move that the Richard Harvey is the appointed uh, chair. I'll second. Uh, okay. Except for the second part of that motion, I, I uh, nominate Director Harvey. To Okay. Um, so um, there is a public hearing time at March 28th um, at 6 p.m. Uh, it will be held here um, at the Harmston office. And uh, input will be accepted through written submissions and in person verbal comments. In the holding of the public hearing, um, Director Hardy will be chair and Director Grieve will be vice chair. Okay, any further discussion? Um, did I get a first and second? No. Got that. Arbor and Grant. Okay, thank you. And it's a vote of the areas, all in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Uh, we actually have an in-camera and and I actually need the in-camera motion. We skipped it at the beginning. Um, we'll be going, we'll be going in camera according to section 91 A, C, and K of the community charter. Moved by Hillian. Second. Seconded by McCollum. Thank you. And all in favor? And we will move in camera. Thank you.